Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the TetraCast. This is RPG Site's weekly podcast where we get the site staff together to talk about our favorite genre of video games. My name is Brian Vitali. We've got the usual crew here today. Let's go through them. Joining me, I have Adam Vitali. Hello. Josh Torres. He minus six days till Elden Ring. And James Galizio. Hey, folks. I guess I say usual crew, but uh, we do not have Chow Min Wu here yet today. Sometimes he shows up late, so we will we will phone him in as if he shows up. Uh, otherwise, he'll just show up, you yes. know, unannounced. Like, hey, what's he does up? that. Uh, but otherwise, uh, obviously, if you listen to our podcast last week, we had a huge like three and a half hour breakdown of both the Nintendo Direct news from a week and a half ago and a surprise uh cameo from alex donaldson to talk about elden ring which is obviously like the big release of the upcoming week coming out on friday uh reviews for that i think should drop slightly earlier and that'll obviously be talked about on next week's podcast not on this one for this one it's a little bit of you know wrapping up some of the news discussion from last week kind of looking ahead at some of the big february releases and a a decent number of big features or reviews up on the site in the last couple of days that i do want to give a shout out to but before that as always we're going to be talking about games we've been playing that we're allowed to talk about and we did have a release just yesterday at the time of recording for the surprise sequel slash second game in the new voice of card series from square enix so we discussed this like when it was announced literally less than a month ago about the new voice of cards the forsaken maiden as kind of a surprise not quite shadow drop for the month of february and we one of us has been uh, going ahead and playing that already so i will hand it off to adam to start out for the games talk section to talk about his time with voice of cards the forsaken maiden yeah so voice of cards came out like yesterday or the day before and horizon zero dawn or forbidden west came out also basically at the same time and i want to play both games but i'm like one of these games is a short you know compact little package it's probably like 15 hours long and one of these is an absolute behemoth let me start with the shorter one so that's why i'm playing voice of cards so before I talk about Forsaken Maiden, I did play the first release, uh, the Isle Dragon Roars, not too long ago. It was right around the Christmas break I played that, so that was only two months ago or so. And my broad take on the first game is that I really like the aesthetic, like the card-based like design of everything that you're playing on, like a tabletop like surface in the background you have everything is narrated by a dungeon master so when characters are talking to each other the characters themselves don't have a voice it's being basically voiced through a dungeon master i think everything about like the style of it that is really cool the music is great um but i the voice of cards games they kind of feel like the first one anyways kind of felt like a beginner rpg uh which is fine but it kind of it was pretty simple, pretty straightforward, not very like intricate, but also not very interesting. To be honest, when I'm thinking about even like the story of it, I don't even remember what happened in the game up until the final like island in that game because that's when it becomes like at least a little bit interesting. And so I was a little bit soured on it that I kind of just blitzed through it and it, nothing really stuck to me. If that makes sense, like and narrative believe- or gameplay. Page who also played it had a similar reaction, which is why, and I'm not sure if anyone else played it uh, on staff, but that, oh, okay, and that's why it didn't quite crack the uh, like when we discussed it last year. I think at the end of the year podcast ended up being kind of our like a, a lukewarm take on the first game. Uh, I, yeah, I did want to get around to it. I think the the games interest me, but I just I'm just not in the mood for that kind of sort of style of game at the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Page was a little bit uh, later on it than I was, uh, more positive on it. Um, but it is kind of like, you you know, it's a more of a low level beginner, like not very intricate RPG. And if you go in with that sort of expectation, maybe, you know, maybe that'll benefit from like what it, what it has to offer for you. Now, playing the Forsaken Maiden, uh, first of all, there was like speculation that this game was a prequel to the first game because of like character art that showed up in the trailer. I'm just going to say right now, I have no idea how it's connected to the first game. I am Hmm. about, I haven't beat it yet. I'm about 10 hours in or so. And I have, there's been nothing that's been an obvious connection to the other game yet. So I don't know. 
<laughs> I don't know so, if it's a prequel, if it's just a separate absolute, thing or what. Nothing like does it have? No, there's no characters. There's the location is different. We're also on island still, so maybe it's in a similar ocean. But uh, I don't know. It's, does it, does it, it, does it doesn't it, seem connected. Does it live up to its uh, name? So I'm gonna assume in the first one, the Isle Dragon did roar. I, is the maiden forsaken in this one for sure? Uh, so in a way, yes. Okay. Uh, so the the premise the to the well, the first game is kind of weird because you don't know what the premise is, and the one once it's actually revealed to you, that's basically it's kind of like a twist in a sense, like oh, that's what the story's about, and that's what I mentioned earlier about. Like how it kind of comes into play in the very last section of that game when you kind of realize what's going on. This game, it's a little bit more uh, in front of you in terms of what's happening. So you are like in an archipelago. There's a bunch of different islands and every island has a maiden. And the maiden is basically there to protect the island and uh, allow it to prosper. And if the if the island doesn't have a maiden, they're, it's basically doomed to uh, obscurity doomed to die doomed to fail disappear whatever uh it's kind of vague like what actually would happen but the, basically they need a maiden now the island that you're from your character is from is called omega island um or omega village on the island i forget it's pretty but, fancy actually Dan. yeah but uh your island does not have a maiden so basically you start up you open the game and you realize uh like everyone is just sort of like you know going about their lives kind of expecting the inevitable we are all going to like perish soon and you know there's nothing we can do about it so it's kind of dumb dumb at the beginning but uh you basically learn that the, one of the main characters lati uh that you find and she's in the trailer and whatnot is like was supposed to be the maiden of the island but ha- has basically failed to achieve that goal and you're you go around sailing to other islands it's literally like cardinal directions east west north south and talking to their maidens about their islands and basically getting their help. And it's sort of, it's, it's a little bit of a, a, of an anthology where every island story is a little bit different in terms of like the South Islands maiden, what she's all about, the, what the island, the, the West Islands maiden and uh, their kind of struggles. So each story is a little bit separate and kind of what's going on. But honestly, I find it, I'm finding it a lot more interesting than the original game. Um, the first game, which is only three months ago or whatever it was. What do you, what do you think just, is like the main defining factor that separates these two and what, what makes this more interesting than the other? It's 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 interesting both. Uh, so it's actually interesting in three ways, more interesting in three ways, narratively, thematically, and mechanically. In terms of like the story itself, it just feels like there's more going on that's important in terms of like each... Uh, maidens like story and struggles and like each island sort of each island island sort of has a little bit of a gimmick to like what's going on in that island but it's just it's more memorable whereas in the first game it feels like you spend the first 75 percent of the game just sort of exploring because the goal in the first game is to basically you're hunting a dragon so you're just kind of like roaming and wandering and you're recruiting a new new characters along the way but it, 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 to me it just wasn't that compelling a dragon here it's like will yeah, but here it's like each story has, uh, each island has an issue. Let me uh, let me start with the second island. Let me just give its premise. Um, the second island, Maiden, is basically a warrior, and they actually portray them. Well, I guess I don't want to spoil this too much, but they are their 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 talent as a maiden is basically called into question, and so they're trying to prove themselves by saying like, "Hey, I can take on." you know, these monsters or these villains or whatever. And you go into and learning about basically their background and how this village basically uh, anoints them as maiden and things like that. And it's, um, and that's just one of three stories I've seen so far. And it just, without like spoiling it, it's more interesting. It actually feels a little bit more like a tarot game, if that makes sense. Um, And as you're learning about these other maidens, you're kind of learning about, Lati, the maiden that you're traveling with, who's a party member. And uh, this is where the more thematic elements come in, where she is basically, um, she can kind of consider, considers herself a failure. Like, uh, what, what, I'm worthless. What's, uh, she actually doesn't talk. That's kind of one thing about her. She, she, she considers herself a failure, so, a failure so heavily that she can't even bring herself to speak. And uh, you kind of learn more about her background. And you are basically fixing her 
uh, heart in a way. You're literally going to like heart rends, I think what they're called, to kind of to, to, to try to fix her in terms of like uh, de unrooting her, her issues and her anxieties and her burdens and things like that. And it just that theme in terms of like healing in a way is way more interesting than anything in the first game, at least up until like the end of the first game. Is the uh, so, actual like presence of heart rends or whatever like a new to this game? Yeah, it's it's not really like a new mechanic there. It's that um, at certain points throughout the story, you enter a heart rend, which is basically like a new location, and it functionally works like any other location. But you're fighting different monsters there. They're like dark, shadowy monsters. You're basically inside Lati's heart, um, healing her in a way. But so it's not mechanically any different there. But it it is you know that's it does feel more like a tarot game in that sense. It's uh. And it just it's more character focused, I guess, where the first game you're just sort of like wandering. Um, so that's more interesting to me. And in terms of mechanics, the first game is a little bit more traditional. You have your main characters. Uh, I actually forget the main character's name, but there's Melanie, who is a magic person. And then there's the main character's uh, partner. I can't for, I can't remember their names, to be honest. Very, um, very yeah. memorable story, apparently. <laughs> No, the first, yeah, the first game, like Melanie is like the one character I remember. The, the main character you can name whatever you want, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, the, the yeah, Forsaken Maiden, uh, it's a lot more memorable. But in the first game, you're just recruiting characters as you're going. You get you you find an archer, you find a, a warrior guy. I don't remember any of their names. Um, here, you have your main character whose name is Baron, and then you have Lati, and then you have uh. Your third character and your fourth character are it's kind of like Final Fantasy II ish, where they're swapped they're swapped out depending on where you are in the game. So like when you go to the South Island to meet the first other maiden there, uh, she joins your party as well as her attendant. And then when you go to the uh, second island, that maiden and their attendant joined your party, and so on. And this mechanically, functionally, what this means is that your main two characters, you're basically training and equipping and setting up how you want. But then the two characters that join you, you, you have, you're a little bit more limited on what you can do with them. I believe you can change their accessory, but that's about it. So that means like we, the way that you're encountering battles on the first island is a little bit different than what it is on the second island because your party makeup is different. And you half your party you can't really actually control. You're like, okay, what do these guys... What are their abilities? What can they do? And how do they work? Um, like, for example, on the second island, I mentioned the warrior maiden and the warrior maiden's um, uh, basically partner there. They're more warrior based. So they're like heavy attack hitters, high defense, things like that. Whereas on the third island, those one of the characters you meet there uh, is more of like a magic user. And they are, their mechanics are around this charge system where you're basically building up points to use stronger abilities. So the way that you proceed in battle is different. And that's just on a gameplay level, that's more interesting to me as well. Whereas you kind of have to change things up as you're playing rather than the first game where once I kind of set my party, I just basically kept them stuck with them, did the same thing the whole way through. So I it's still in general really like right. when uh, RPGs have that sort of like time limited area specific character or whatever guest characters just because like it always seems so manufactured when it's like a jrpg uh where it's like we have our core four of friends or whatever or core six or seven or eight party and they they do everything together and you always use these throughout the whole game where it makes more sense where it's like okay like I, this is kind of maybe a silly example but uh like in kingdom hearts i always make sure to use like the world specific character just because it just changes up the flow and the feel of battle and luckily if the game is, is smartly designed you're not punished by using like a guest character or something like that um or i was thinking even like uh when you talked about having two party members and like the rest is like support characters uh tales of Symphonia 2 where you have emil and marta and then you have just your uh either the monsters or your like cameo first game characters in general i just kind of yeah. like that framework at a high level just having like rotating cast because it does kind of force you to like not to say like i like these four characters the best i'm going to use them the whole game and maybe that's a personal problem to not have like the incentive to change it up i kind of like it when it's like forced upon you where it's like, all right this character is a mage i don't normally use mages but let's see what they're capable of and this game is like okay you're on this east island or whatever i'm going to go ahead and give you a mage character yeah it's, it's one of those things where like the game is restricting you slightly where you can't just pick you know 
whichever character you want to use, you're forced upon it. It's forced upon you in a sense. So it kind of forces you to actually like strategize and think and like approach things differently. Um, the game itself is still, you know, I would call like entry level sort of RPG. It's not really intricate. It's clearly not meant to be like the way that these things are created and released. It's, you know, it's a simpler game. It's a shorter game. Um, I beat the first game in about 15 hours. And like I said, I'm about 10 hours into this one and it feels like I'm well into the second half. I don't know if I'm, if I'm like near the end or at, you know, the 75% mark, I'm not sure, but uh, that's kind of, you know, the length scale we're talking about here. And, um, but it does feel like it's a little bit just, just a hair more difficult because of the way that it restricts you a bit more in terms of, um, game balance. And whereas the first game, I kind of found a, I kind of coordinated a party that worked relatively early on. And then I basically never moved from that because I didn't have any reason to, but here I can't do that. Uh, so I think I'm enjoying it more basically uh, across the board, um, as a, you know, as for this style of game. Now, now, once I beat it, I'm not sure. Like, if if people were to ask which which game should I play first, Isle Dragon Roars or this one, or does it matter? I'll see if there's any like more t- tangible story connection at right all. Right now, you're for any other matter. reason. Yeah, like right now, it seems like they're just kind of separate games that are stylized functionally the same. Um, but there's, I'm not done yet, so we'll see. I, yeah, I mean, kinda, you, you never know, right? Because the, the, this is like kind of uh, like Yokotaro's pet, uh, pet project. So, like, it, it, the, at the back of your mind, it's like he's doing this for a reason, right? <laughs> and like, just announcing yeah. these games kind of out of nowhere, no one fucking knew there was a second Voice of Cards game until like what feels like two two weeks ago. Week, yeah, two <laughs> weeks ago before it's like, oh, I guess there's one of these. Do you think there's gonna be a third Voice of Cards game this year? Yeah, I mean, they'll just announce it next week and it'll come out like, yeah. March 12th or yeah. something. <laughs> but there is, um, I there in the trailer, it showed a character that looked a lot like a young Melanie who was from the first game. So I'm, I haven't met that character yet. And I don't know if it maybe is a, a, maybe a false a red herring of some sort or something else, but like, we'll see. And then there's all, I, and then all these voice of cards games are just a big prequel to whatever the next big, big, big game is. Well, at the end of the voice of cards series, it's gonna like pull out and show like the game people actually playing this game. It's gonna be like I don't know, <laughs> like uh, Emil from 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 near just playing a card game, and this is the game he's playing. I don't know. Uh, I hope it's not that actually. But, I, I was gonna say I hope it's actually just like I hope they just allow it to be like standalone stories in a similar framework rather than being like yeah, now part of the Taroverse. Right? How can we meta connect these? How do you have to read uh, Grimoire near in order to understand what this is? I don't know. Are any other final? I mean, I guess it will just wrap back up next week when you finish the game to see if your impressions change or if they do anything similar with the story to really change it up in the last act like they did in the first game. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't really have any more to say about it right now. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely enjoying it more than the first game, just kind of in every sense. So, which I, you know, narrator do you prefer? I prefer the narrator to the first game, but mm. after playing this one, I kind of understand the reason why they changed it. And for the record, they changed the narrator, like the voice actor, in both languages. So it was clearly like like a, a deliberate creative choice. decision. Yeah, yeah. and it, it just like the different narrator just gives it a different like feel. So it kind of help, helps the games feel a little bit more unique, even though they look similar. Because the way that everything is narrated is has a different flavor to it because it's a different voice. So I kind of understand the reason why they did it. Um, but I do prefer the first narrator. He the he sounded a little bit in English. I played in English. He sounds a little bit more like uh, grizzled, a little bit more veteran, like experienced in a way where this the voice in the second game was a little younger, a little bit like livelier. And, you know, it's just a different flavor. Um, one thing that's sort of uh, one small thing that I actually found kind of interesting I actually don't quite remember what the line was off the top of my head, but so in the game, like I mentioned, everything is basically narrated. Like it's literally like, like an audio book, like all the dialogue, everything that happens is basically narrated by a voice actor. And there was this one uh, line and I'm sure it's happened multiple times, but there was one in particular where the, the text on the screen shows up that he reads like he normally does throughout the entire game, but the narrator actually flubbed the line. Like he messed it up. And he's like, excuse me. And then he then he said the line again. 
like it was intentional. Like I, I don't like, know if like this was like, like he's an like, storyteller like or something. Yeah, yeah. He, he, but it kind of felt feel like he's like a real person, like like stating this to you rather than like a perfectly scripted line or something. Um, you know, like a DM at a real D and D party or whatever, you know, he, he's saying his, you know, like this, this narrative, this beat that's happening. He's like, excuse me, let me do that again. And then he says it again. I'm like, that's cool. You know, like he's coming so, up with it on the fly or he hasn't practiced it. I like that. Yeah. All right. So we will wrap back up with you next week to see what your seemingly concluding thoughts are on voice of cards uh what's the subtitle again <laughs> I keep the forsaken to maiden and yeah, it, it seems like the maiden. forsaken maiden is the is obviously lati the character you're with because she sort of failed and i don't know if i mentioned this but because she's kind of been considered a failure everyone around her kind of shuns her and that's also one reason why she's mute but yeah that's like the sort of character stuff that i think is more interesting than the first game so last week we talked at length about the uh, new in the West MMO Lost Ark. Now, obviously, being a new MMO, we kind of had uh, Josh has been the one that has put the most time into this. But uh, during our discussion, just kind of setting up the the premise, touching you know the surface of the waves of of the game itself, touching about the progression, a little bit of how it changes at end game, and some of Josh's specific experiences with it. Uh, so I want to just kind of like wrap back around to Lost Ark, obviously as a big game, to maybe go into maybe some more uh, specific details about how Josh's experience with Endgame has been, with raiding, with his uh, guild experience, just kind of more like into the minutia about how the game feels once you've gotten past the uh, the leveling aspect of it. So uh, I'll hand it off over to Josh, and I know that uh, James has also been playing this a fair bit. Yeah, I'm like well into like tier two right now trying to almost get to item level 1060 that's kind of my progress with it at the moment and how uh, this basically works at end game is after you get to level 50 and um you kind of you eventually get to a main story quest where it says hey reach this item level and then that's kind of like the loop of the game from then on where uh the main story your main story quest objective is like hey reach this item level and then you, you know, obtain these item level. This kind of maybe recapping some of the info that I said last week, but it was so much, you know, uh, uh, to introduce this game from the get go. But um, it, all your item level is uh, affected only by like your the the things that you're wearing: your your headgear, your chest piece, your shoulder piece, your gloves, your weapon, your 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 uh, shoes. And so and none of your accessories, uh, like your necklaces and rings and whatnot, don't affect your item. Level. It's only those. So a lot, a lot of that, uh, the end game loop, uh, you know, which is could very much be well your thing or not. For for me, it works for me, but for others, I can see why this might not be a great. Is like, hey, well, you, uh, when you reach the first like tier one. Uh, you uh, complete this continent main story quest, uh, Shushire, or you do these uh, daily quests called Chaos Dungeons, which are basically hordes of enemies that you uh, beat up to a fillimeter, and then you get rewarded at the end with uh, mats. So you either get gear either from your tier one gear, either from the Chaos Dungeon or completing that main story continent, and then you have this basic. Oh, wait, it, it just gives you like uh, eye level what? what from- 302. Yeah so, after, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so after you're done with Shushan, it'll give you like a wish chest, and then it'll give you your full set of item level 302 gear, and that's kind of your starting point of endgame right there, because what you're doing from then on out is you're upgrading these uh, this set that you have um, uh, at the honing uh, person, and then you're using like uh, mats, like these uh, green harmony shards, and these uh, destruction and guardian fragments. Uh, and a little bit of your silver, and, t- and eventually a little bit of your gold, um, to uh, get get them up to the item level six hundred. I know. I think. I think the first breaking point is item level forty four sixty to unlock the new main story quest, and then. But you eventually want to get them to item level six hundred, uh, and then so you g- obtain those mats by basically playing the game and exploring these islands uh, throughout the world uh, that uh, award these tier one. Mats and these I- I- islands that we went over, uh, you know, briefly uh, last week. Right? These islands could be freaking anything, you know, like uh, what they have. Like uh, the I mentioned, I became a panda in one of them. The others, you might be, you know, trying to help uh, a lost person with all these hidden quests. 
uh, roaming about another. It could just be freaking any. Like the, I, I visited an island for a tier two mats uh, yesterday. Where all yet the, uh, the the main thing I wanted for it was like not even mats, but like a, a token for a skill potion. Um, but all all you did on that island was just chop chop giant mushrooms. That's that's you. That's all you did was hey, yeah. there's these o- overgrown mushrooms. And then since the the game has a really really funny mechanic where like normally chopping down trees and anything by yourself is slow. But someone else can come and like chop down the tree with you, so it the, your axe turns into like a giant uh, saw between you two at opposite ends. You're just sawing, sawing together, and it goes yeah. faster, and you get more mats, and that's like a really funny, you know, I, I small like touch. That, to something it. they it's, didn't it's have to do. Play. Yeah, but the fact that they did that is just like there's a lot of little details like that in this game, and it's really nice. Yeah, uh, one it, thing. Go for it. One thing I kind of want to stress for people that are maybe listening and it's like, man, that sounds like a bit of a a slog to uh, grind up uh, item level. Keep in mind that when the game came out in Korea, only tier one was available. And yeah, we have so a lot it, of content off from the get go. Like, like it's easy to burn yourself out if you're trying to do vertical progression very fast. Uh, yeah, this, like this tier is more meant for like you know if you want to play a little bit every day, that's fine too because like, uh, uh, like uh, even even if you just do like your your dailies uh, uh, and like your daily chaos or daily guardians or whatever, like like it, just accruing those mats like slowly, like, you'll you'll make progression as long as like you put as a little bit of time in. And even if you don't like play for that day, you, you your character still gain accrue rested bonus, uh, yeah. rested XP. So let's say you haven't touched a character like in three days. Like if you touch them again to do their stuff uh, three days later, like you'll gain extra rewards because they accrued a rested bonus uh, from uh, that time you, that you did. You, you might have explained this last week and I might have missed it, but when you're yeah. max level, what does your EXP go to? Does it like convert to currency or something? You do still technically have levels you can grind towards. Um, you can get up to level 60. And I do believe that there's like some like level gating for like further upgrading certain skills. So the, yeah, so uh, um, level fifty is your soft is your soft cap. You still gain a uh, experience over time, but it's not something that like you're actively trying to get to. That's just something that will happen naturally over time as you continue to play the game and do, do progress through these tiers. Yeah, to um, put in perspective, it's like what. 2 million XP to go from level 49 to 50, and then it's like 48 million or something. 43 yeah. million. Yeah, it, it's very explicitly you don't need to be higher than 50. It's just something that will naturally happen. Yeah, but yeah, and then obviously when you like reach like stuff like level 55 and like I think level 58 or level 60, like you'll gain uh, extra skill points as that, but you also can get uh, skill potions, and then the, those uh, are just you do certain content in the game. So, for example, the thing that I was talking about earlier was the, the this giant mushroom island, and in this giant mushroom island, you there's a chance every time you cut down a giant mushroom for you to get this island's token, and if you uh, collect twenty island tokens, and all, all of these islands have different activities and different ways to get your uh, those tokens. Um, you exchange them to a vendor on Lo- Lonely Island, and the- and then once you hit twenty, you can get a skill potion that way. Another way is getting these items called Giant's Hearts, uh, through various ways. Like one is like a a currency vendor for a certain island. Another is doing other activities uh, to get this Giant's Heart. Like you get your first Giant's Heart from like using a Power Pass, which is given to you for free when you reach level fifty to like boost another character. Um, so it's just that it's like you you gain skill points by leveling, but you also gain more skill points as well through skill potions, skill point potions. So it's not something that's like you know, you don't have to stress about getting over level fifty. That, that's not really the point. Um, so yeah, and then the the way that end game progression works is like you have this set that you have um, given to you, and then you get that to eventually to level six hundred. And once you get to item level six hundred, it unlock a new main story continent you do all the stuff there um and then you, it, once again it'll say hey the main story will say hey uh reach item level um i think it was like 940 is the next point uh and then yeah, the the nice thing about like this going from tier 1 to tier 2 is there's a lot of islands that reward these tier 1 mats so 
I kind of did the prep work uh, early on uh, of getting these tier one islands done and, and and a bit of tier two, like a future proofing. So I was able to get there, you know, on a fairly like uh, good pace. And once I was able to uh, upgrade from the tier one set into the tier two set, um, since I did like a good chunk of those islands that awarded those tier two materials to upgrade, I was able to shoot up from like item level like like from 600 to like 840 and then to like 1000 within like the span of like half an hour but then you know as as you start getting higher and higher um it, it, those resources become more down. scarce yeah it slows down you become more scarce and that that's something like you get you, once again you either accrue through dailies or uh the the big elephant in the room is like how do they monetize this game um the Lost Ark is, I, I guess, the conversation surrounding this game is like everyone has a different definition of what pay to win means. I would um, say my personal definition is Lost Ark's not pay to win; it's pay to speed up grinding. And even then, like the actual stuff that really matters, you can't exactly pay for. Like yeah. the, the roster like buffs, you have mm -hmm. to do stuff in the world. You have to find collectibles. You have to do side quests. You have to do uh, a report, report, all that sort of stuff. You have to actually engage with the content to get those permanent buffs. And the things that you can pay for, the upgrade materials, they're limited to how much you can buy through like Mari's secret shop, I think. Yeah, so the, there's, a, there's just a, a like a, the, the in-game uh, store menu has this like uh, a thing called Mari's Secret Shop, and this secret shop uh, uh, takes in blue crystals, which is basically, oh god, the currency conversion is so stupid in this game. So let let me explain currency uh, let me explain currency conversion before we start touching Mari's Secret Shop, uh, which James touched on. So in this game, you uh, you gather both silver and gold. Gold, silver, don't worry about silver. That's like a, a resource that like you have a lot of. You gain, uh, you know, this is your basic currency in the game as you level and you just buy it with like basic items of that. It's uh, it's very very negligible. Um, gold is something that you get um, either through doing your abyssal du dungeons, like your first clear abyssal dungeons for the week, like because there's weeklies uh, that reset your abyssal dungeon clears, and then from tier two on, those reward gold for per clear of each abyssal dungeon. Um, you gain gold that way. You also gain gold through selling stuff on the auction house. Um, and you also gain gold through several, like, in-game time-sensitive auction events where um, there are these things called um, Twisted uh, Nightmare Gates, I, I think they were called. Um, and, chaos, uh, chaos Gates. Uh, chaos. I believe there's, like, different types of... Uh something like legion yeah but... so so yeah essentially the these these gates appear at the top of every uh, hour on certain days of the week I, I don't know which days of the week but i know on weekends they're usually open and then some days of the week they're open at the top of every hour and then so you go there they open up and then uh, a maximum maximum of 30 people can enter there um it's just basically just hey, go beat up all the enemies there and then beat up the big boss at the end. And the, after, after that, it'll have an auction for the secret map. Um, people bid gold on the secret map. You don't have to bid gold on it, but people will big, bid, you know, at, at where I'm at, at like the tier of Chaos Gates that I'm do, doing. It, it's like average five, 5k gold people are bidding on these secret maps. Uh, you get a share of, the, uh, of that, of the highest bid. So let's say this map sold like fifty one hundred gold to the highest bidder. I get like one hundred thirty seven gold from that, even though I didn't like I, I just for participating. I didn't bid at all because it's because I was just there. So yeah, because whoever's bidding for it and wins is basically paying every other member of the uh, party that cleared the gate for um, basically letting them have the map. Yeah. Yeah, it's all I, automated. Yeah, yeah. That that secret map. Don't worry about that secret map. It's for other stuff. That is already a lot to parse. But they, those are the kind of the, the ways you get gold. You can also pay real money to get gold. But 
So, so this is how it, the currency conversion goes in that uh, in-game shop: is you pay gold, or no, you pay for royal crystals to turn into gold. So you're paying real; you can pay real money for royal crystal currency. That royal crystal currency you can also currency exchange into gold. Now, so from the, there, so the crystals are like the premium currency, and then there's a conversion to gold, so you can effectively buy in-game currency, but yes. only gold, not silver. Only gold, not silver, because uh, yeah, you don't worry, don't ever, you don't ever, ever have to worry about silver. Um, now, from gold that like that you can buy from with royal crystals, you can convert into gold. You can convert that gold into blue crystals. So there's a second currency conversion. To access like the currency that the Mari Secret Shop uses, so you you can turn gold whether you bought that gold or whether you earned it in game. You can convert it to blue crystals, and then that's the currency you can use at the Mari Secret Shop to buy materials if you want to just progress faster. That's the and that that's that the now. The definition of pay to win to people is once again very different. For people, it's like if you put any money into your character, it's pay to win. Like you're prog- you're you're paying to progress faster, so you're paying to win. Which is if that's your definition, that's your definition. You know, I'm not gonna say you're wrong one way or the other because at the end of the day, the facts are the facts. Are you you can definitely pay real money to progress faster into higher tier. Now, whether whether that um higher tier of equipment will make you more successful in uh raids and whatnot in guardian raids um mm, the guardian yeah, raids no. quickly get yeah pretty challenging yeah, yeah the, the like you have to learn the game still you still have to learn attack patterns or else you're gonna get smoked like you maybe you can take like maybe you can you can take more hits like early to early our guardian raids if you want and be tanky and whatnot but for the ones that actually matter to you you have to learn the mechanics and that, that that's that's not something you can pay real money for yeah, to like one, breeze on through yeah one thing that actually really stood out to me especially uh early on was that i'll be honest i went into the abyssal dungeons not really knowing about them that much and that's fine enough for the first abyssal dungeon in the game because there's no mechanics it's just dodge aoe dodge aoe's do damage but then the very next one, you go into it and it's like, okay, so everyone needs to have a cardinal position for the second counter because he will do an AoE mm-hmm. once he gets to near lethal HP. And if it's red, everyone needs to go to their cardinal direction and click the red orb. So we, And then you have to do that three times in order to kill him. If you don't, then he'll keep um, resurrecting and eventually you'll uh, hit in rage. And oh, yeah. even the encounter yeah. before that it's like okay so every so often the boss is going to let out a raid wide which uh, gives you an orb debuff and once you have the number of orbs above your head that corresponds to your number on the party list you're going to go to the golden orb that spawns right after the raid wide and cleanse it make sure you do it in order because you need to keep that rhythm up or because if if uh, any one person gets five stacks of the orb debuff it's an insta wipe yeah it, it wraps up pretty fast and it, 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 i really enjoyed the learning process of that in my guild so that, 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 that let's uh, yeah uh, for people who don't want to know raid mechanics maybe skip ahead because that is a very 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 yeah, first I mean, raid yeah like i like, mean i'm, I'm very early. i didn't f- first off the main reason i didn't feel bad about oh, mentioning yeah. that is that if you're going into the abyssal raids yeah. please at least know that mechanic yeah please yeah. Yeah, like, so yeah. To break it down, like you know, uh, the, this raid that uh, James was mentioning, just to you know reiterate, like one of the early bosses in it, you there, there's a like this massive. I forgot what, what creature it was. Was it a dragon? I forgot. It, it was a dragon, okay. and it's and it's funny because like so much of this game, it's very clear that the developers are huge Monster Hunter fans because the dragon looks like a kind of mix of like Valhazak and uh, fuck, what was um, Gormagala. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, like, the entire Guardian Raid system is basically just Monster Hunter, but isometric. And yeah. there's literally Gunlancer, where some of its, like, attacks basically have the same animations as Gunlance attacks in Monster Hunter. Yeah, it, so, but, but, yeah, what James was mentioning, so, like, yeah, one of the raid mechanics in this one is, hey, the, the like, 
throughout the fight, you know, you're dodging, you know, uh, scripted attacks, and then that there's a there's a roar that it lets out, kind of kind of lets out like a, a like a aura around it, and then everyone's affected by it, and everyone has these little dark orbs over their head, and then the the mechanic here is that hey, if any one of you gets to five five dark orbs over your head, it, the this this creature will go to like the corner of the screen and like you'll only see its silhouette and then just swoop down and kill all of you all at once if anyone any one of you reaches these five stacks so as james was mentioning throughout the fight after you're all afflicted somewhere in the map it'll show on your mini map as well um that there's like this item called like a golden orb and then uh, if you touch this item it'll cleanse that marker off of you but only for you no one else so as james was mentioning that you, you already have to establish like party order or early on of like okay yeah uh, party like uh, the party member number one you're the one who's doing going first to, to cleanse it party member number two uh after that you get your two uh two orbs go cleanse it the party number the member number three once you get your three orbs go cleanse it and you have to keep in the strict order to and uh, maintain this flow throughout the fight in order to be successful the fight itself isn't hard uh, uh, aside from learning that one mechanic but yeah. then you get to, like the the final boss of that raid dungeon, and it's like there's um, like stagger checks. There's yeah, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, there, 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 yeah. Throughout fights, there'll be stagger checks where you have to it, put enough damage into a boss, or else it'll wipe you or do a lot of damage. Well, if not correct, that, not enough damage, enough stagger, which is different. Right. Oh yeah, so, sorry, sorry. You're right. You're right. Yeah, because all uh, certain skills in this game. Uh, have a, a stat called uh, stagger on them, and um, obviously the higher the higher it is, like it'll be like stagger mid or stagger mid high or stagger high. Uh, that that just indicates like, hey, using this skill during these stagger checks on a boss will do a lot of damage, or you know, mid damage depending on uh, the skill itself. Um, so the the next boss, aside from all that, uh, the the lore for this boss is that they're immortal. And so it has like 20 life bars. You whittle it down, and then it's like, what's going on? Well, why why is the screen going white or red? Like this is weird. And like, well, what's actually happening in that fight is that at every corner of the map, uh, there's two or two colored orbs, red or white. And then depending on the color of like your screen, like the arena, like everyone will have the same color. Someone has to call out. It's red, it's red, or it's white, it's white. And everyone has to not only get into their own pre-designated positions that you agreed upon uh, on, on each corner of the map, but they also have to get uh, like interact with the right colored orb so it regenerates less. And like the more the, the more that you have wrong in that check, the more it res- resurrects with more life bars. Um, and, the, and then each phase of the fight as it resurrects becomes tougher and tougher, it does more damage. It gets attack new attacks. Yeah. yeah, it gets more new attacks. So, and then uh, I won't spoil the other ones, but like the 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 tier two ones that I've seen and, and experienced, like I did all the tier two ones, uh, at least for the it's like a water palace. Um, I didn't do the the part one of those yet, but the like some of them are crazy, <laughs> really crazy. I'll just say. Yeah, I'm like, looking forward to it because yeah. like when I got into the abyssal stuff, it's like. Well, I knew that the raids in this game eventually get really crazy with mechanics because like everyone I think that was interested in Lost Ark saw that video about what's the English name that they got for her? Was it Belshaza? Yeah, I think that one where it's like it's like you're on the uh, cube arena with like nine segments and there's a bunch Mm -hmm. of like mechanics centered around that. And it's like I knew eventually the mechanics ramped up, but I didn't expect it to be like kind like so quickly and like especially like in final fantasy it's very clear when you're entering into high-end content but with uh lost ark it doesn't really kind of communicate it i feel like so once i got to the uh, um abyssal dungeons which they should be called abyssal raids not abyssal dungeons i understand why they're called that because they're like remixed harder versions of story dungeons it looks like but still (laughs) they're very explicitly raids (laughs) yeah yeah the the terminology and the and the localization is it's still taking time for me to wrap my head around it like how they change life skills and the yeah i think if skills. anyone's interested in getting into lost ark that maybe has experience with final fantasy uh well 14 
think of think of the abyssal dungeons as like the first couple at least are around like extreme difficulty in regards to mechanics required and i'm assuming that as they get harder it'll be closer to savage and then onward from there Oh yeah, I imagine like the the tier like the the tier three abyssals. I imagine are really freaking crazy. Is tier three in the game right now, or is that later? Yes, yeah, tier is, three is, is in the it, game. That's the is that the highest? Place. That's yes. the highest. Yeah, it, 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 throughout all regions, tier three is the highest. Oh, okay. Um, you so you know how I mentioned earlier, like you get a set of like blue gear item level three hundred two. Um, the abyssal um, dungeons are where you get um, higher tiers of gear, like. Say purples. like your purples and oranges. Um, and those are the ones that have set bonuses. So yes. what you want to do is that before you get purples, you're just going to upgrade your blues, and then once you get purples, you'll just uh, gear transfer. Yeah. So what the what the game does generously, like I, I've known a lot of really bad MMOs that uh, uh, that kind of screw you over on this. Is hey, let's say you have enough currency from the the abyssal dungeons like it's a very very simple crafting they get you these crystals you go to the abyssal crafter and then say hey, i want to exchange like four of these crystals that dropped in the in the in the abyssal for like a, a an orange like head headset and an orange chest piece and like it's very simple a very simple exchange uh, and then once you get that that gear you don't have to start over on upgrading them you can set you can just simply go to the honing Person and say, hey, hey, I wanna, I, I wanna transfer this plus thirteen on this blue head uh, headgear onto this new orange one that I got, and then you just pay a very meager amount of silver to do that, and then it consumes that item and transfers that plus thirteen over to that to, to that new gear, no questions asked. You don't have to start over or anything. Um, and it, uh, the it works this uh, a very similar way uh, to when you're going from tier one to tier two. So let's say. Your, uh, obviously, your gear is going to be at plus 15 for your old set because you needed that to get to this item level. And then once you start getting your tier 2 armor set, uh, and then this this one, they don't give you give it to you for free. You have to do Chaos Dungeons uh, for to get them to drop, but they're pretty ho- easy to come by. Like By the end of it, you'll have either one or two just missing, and you can just buy them from the auction house for a very small amount of gold. Um you can just use that plus 15 tier 1 gear and then move it over to your tier 2 armor set, but it won't do a plus 15 one-to-one transfer. It'll just consume that and then give you a free plus 1 uh, to get you get started on, on the next tier of gear uh, on that. So that's kind of... The, 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 but that's, the, that's the, just in a very long way to say this is how Endgame is. It's a lot of engaging with the content in the game and then being awarded with mats uh, uh, by experiencing the content in the game, and um, that's your end game loop of like you're constantly upgrading your current gear to get uh, to break these item level um, gates to get do the main next main story uh, quest continent, and then upon completion of that, you get you gain new access to or new tiers of your daily activities, new chaos dungeon uh, tiers, new guardian raids. New abyssal dungeons, and then so forth. That's so. Uh, is there a story uh, lock behind like the raid content? Then, if you have to like do that to get to an item level to unlock the story, uh, not quite because you can just uh, get the materials doing like chaos dungeons and even like login rewards and stuff. Mm-hmm. So. Oh well, okay. Well, there uh, uh, early abyssal dungeons is revisiting areas that you did in the story. Later ones. They actually do have story content in them. Interesting. Yeah. So that that's uh, that's what I'll say about that. Um, but but that but that that doesn't like gate you from doing like main story like continents. It's not like hey, in order to do this continent, you need to see like this story beat from this abyssal dungeon. No 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 no. Uh, you, you don't need to do that. If you just want to worry about that later, just do your start doing that main story content. You're free to. And let me tell you, like. I don't really, I'll be honest, I don't really care about the story of this game. Like, I know the overarching premise, I know some of the characters, and, like, that's cool and all, but, I, but like, I, I, the main story doesn't really interest me as much as the gameplay, but some of the set pieces in those later continents uh, are insane. <laughs> I'm like, 
what in the fuck is happening? <laughs> it's nuts. <laughs> I do it's like, in general, the premise of basically just being told an item level and just saying, get there however you want. Mm-hmm. Like, I kind of like the freedom that that kind of seems to offer. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's it's nonlinear like uh, progression uh, in the sense that you kind of set your own terms and goals on how you want to get there. If you want to take it easy, that's fine. If you want to sweat it up, that's fine too. Um, yeah, so. I feel like I really want to stress this because I keep seeing people that kind of don't seem to have the right idea. So many people are caught up on, oh, I need to get to tier three. Oh, I need to get there as quickly as possible. When it's like. No, you don't. Still going to be there. Like the way the content works, you're going to have to engage with all the content leading up to it anyways. You might as well enjoy yourself. Have a good time. Find content. It's like... Play play the game. I don't know. (laughs) Don't burn yourself out just to get to the end game when like the the people that were actually going to be sweaty about that are already sweaty about it and have already got there. Don't stress yourself out. Yeah. So... uh... Like if you're if you're like I don't, I don't know because on on some level like it's it's hard not to feel peer pressured but if the, if, the, if that's it like I'll just say to people like if you're vulnerable to that sort of peer pressure then maybe this game's not for you if like you're if you're looking around and you're seeing like all your friends like you know make uh, progress faster than you and you and you feel stressed by that like I wouldn't recommend this like end game loop for you then because like you you should be in charge of like how you want to play a game and if that and if that's like to the point that like it's really like damaging you mentally then i would i would say don't don't put yourself through that um for, for sure because i i get that i can i can definitely see that perspective of it but yeah uh, it's I, just I, when i it? see people that are like oh man this game is so grindy like I, it's so hard like upgrading stuff and it's and the reason why they're hitting that wall is because they're trying to bum rush like two years of content in two weeks. It just, yeah, they're just, they're just feels, fixated on the, on the finish line. Yeah. I don't want to say it's disingenuous because I don't think they're trying to say they're trying to be that way. It's just, it feels weird seeing people act like that. When in reality, if you're playing the game at a slower pace, it feels more natural. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, I'm I'm still having a good time. Um, I, at at the moment, there's really like not much else to say about this game. Like in terms of like how the game is played, how progress is uh, done. I I I might write up something on it, depending on like you know, I'll have to talk to Alex about it. But it's it's a it's appealing to me in a way from a perspective where I've really fallen off of MMOs in the past few years. Like I was really into like Korean MMOs, like. Ragnarok Online, Cabal, Atlantica, uh, Guns is an MMO, but I was into guns and all. And like you know, I, I and I've been exposed to like stuff like. Oh, actually, I did play a little bit of DFO as well, and then stuff like Fly FF and all those other old old Korean MMOs. Like uh, you know, and I've I've seen a good chunk of them, and I'm like, man, I, I was just so predisposed of like this. Like I could see why Korean MMOs are designed the way they are, but I don't. I really don't like the way they're. They were structured and how scummy some of their monetization schemes uh, were formed. I think Lost Ark appeals to me because, like, you could if you really took the time to think about it and dig into it and play the game, like, you'll see that it's not it's it's a way a bigger, bigger, bigger step above than like K, K- MMOs of the past in terms of like how it wants you to engage with the content and how it's not trying to like wring you dry of your money in the process of that because. If you if you treat it as a marathon and not a sprint, you're in for a good time. Um, if you're just trying to sprint, then you're gonna get burned out really fast. Um, but I I like it because like I can take it at my own pace and not feel like oh, oh okay well I have to like what's the what's the point of rushing to tier three? At the end of the day, you're into you're in tier three and then what you know. Yeah, it's like whenever <laughs> when is tier four going to be out? Because you have plenty of time to get caught up with tier three before tier four is a thing, and then like everyone's going to be on the same page with tier four. And it's like, was it worth it at the end? Who knows? You know, but it's just so it, it's to me, it feels refreshing. I, I really like that. It's like it's it's more active gameplay. It's a lot of like positioning yourself at the right spots and like actively dodging and like like all your hits aren't like 
like predisposed like you actually have to manually aim your aim your stuff and like position yourself and uh, to me i like that active engagement in combat uh, I know, but by the question, way like the yeah. uh the raid fights sure. that you're talking about like how like how large are the parties here like five man ten man eight man twenty man um the the early ones are four man so a, a good chunk of like i think all of tier one and like the first half of like tier two is all four man um but then when you want to get to the part two of the tier two raids, those are all eight man. Okay. Just curious. I'm just trying to like paint a picture in my head. Like how many guys am I imagining like doing the mechanics that you guys walk through? So it sounds like it's going to be four for most of them. Four for most of them. Eight man does have very um, intimate mechanics though. <laughs> the way they, like uh, th- those are, those are a lot of fun. Um, I, I'm kind of curious, James. Uh, uh, I don't know which guardians uh, you've uh, fought yet, but which are the ones that really struck out to you, uh, stuck out to you? It's like, a- as someone, as both of us who played a shit little monster hunter, like, what were your first impressions? Like, as you progress through um, harder, I, harder guardians, I loved how the very first guardian is basically just like straight up a ripoff of uh, Monster Hunter Monster. Where it's like, oh, it's the bear. <laughs> yeah, it's like Arzuros. It's like, all right, yeah. or Voldadon. <laughs> it's Arzuros, but red. <laughs> it even had the same they, like slashing animation. <laughs> yeah, and it's like they they wear their inspirations on their sleeve. Uh, oh, yeah. I've done all of the the first four uh, Guardian raids. I don't want to do the first one of the second like tier of Guardian raids mm-hmm. because like the last one of the first tier just like kicked my ass. <laughs> which one? Which one was that? Uh, remind me. I, I, I forget the name of it. It's what was, what was the mechanics and like what, what it, it dives like? under the ice and then jumps out. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, that dude's an asshole. Yeah, dude. That those 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 hits like when he dives underground, it's like very very sudden. It's like and oh then, my like, god. <laughs> and then God, we got the kill, but it's like I was out of potions and I was going to run to get more at the uh, base, and then he get got me in the grab attack when I was under half health, and I just oh no, I, I just typed in the party chat. Rep. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing you can do there. Yeah. That's uh some of these fights get really visceral compared to like Monster Hunter. It's like it really surprises surprises me. Like it's like they're definitely MMO fight the the fights, but in a way that like it feels like it's like something that's like I would never have like done like this in Monster Hunter, <laughs> you know. So it's uh really funny. Really funny. How hard's the first one for the second tier of uh, Guardian raids? I don't. I'd have to like see the the monster. I don't remember which one that is off the get from the get go. Is it um, a super noticeable jump up from that ice dude? Um, I can I don't remember it being that hard to be honest. Uh, like I I think I think the more threatening ones are like the third or fourth monsters of a okay, certain thing. Okay. So I, I I don't think it'll be that bad. Yeah. Um, but they're definitely like I I already know like two of the big roadblocks for you later on of like oh these monsters are gonna be a bitch once you see them yeah um item level definitely helps a bit though I'm sure oh yeah yeah for, uh, for the item level does uh, affect that content and like uh, of you taking more hits but once you're like taking on like but if you're taking on guardian levels that are like matching your eye level then it's like it's it's a real uh, sink or swim moment well it sounds like we're going to like kind of keep tabs on lost ark as long as you and james are interested in keep playing it but it's good to have kind of these, these big first two western release uh podcast sections on it to discuss all the games all the aspects of the game like the islands the continents the how the pre and post level 50 works uh yeah. how the how the skill system works and how the how the combat works and things like that so i'm guessing we'll like- just kind of Go ahead. Yeah, I feel like if anything I want to stress very hard is that you absolutely can play this game without paying a cent. Like, mm-hmm. there are things that are useful. Like, I'd say the very first thing I would recommend anyone actually buy would be, like, one of those ship skins that makes it so that it automatically fast sales for you during auto sales. I, I did that. I fucking did that. I feel, I, don't, I, I don't know if I feel good about it, but, like, as time passes, free- I can just have out. Yeah, it's a free to play game. And I mean, it's not like you can't just press the button. It's just like a quality of life feature that you pay for. And I think that's fine. I think that's fine. Yeah, that's that. To me, that's 
the sum of like the what you're paying for this game you're you're really paying for convenience and if you do re- if you're adamant about not paying a cent at it that, that that's totally fine and you can comp- you can like progress just like everyone else uh, naturally in this game at your own pace so you know but i i get it but like i it's it's so hard to like shake off like the stigma of kmmos uh honestly because at, at the end of the day this is still bought, like you know has a lot of the philosophies of a, of a, what defines a Korean MMO, uh, but like yeah. it, 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 it it's more generous and improves upon it in key ways. But it, I don't think it'll ever get rid of the stigma uh, surrounding it as uh, one of those type of ge- types of games in that genre because people have such a, such a negative negative negative, uh, just like perce- like they're perceived as a very negative thing in the West. Now, the last game we want to take a chance to talk about is one that I wasn't expecting. And we know that about a month ago, Adam regaled us with his time uh, spending time getting caught up with the Star Ocean series ahead of Star Ocean, the Defined Force uh, later this year. And he also played a game that I forgot existed. Adam, tell me about what in the world Star Ocean Blue Sphere is and your thoughts on it. I feel like occasionally I just kind of come in on these podcasts, some random game to talk about for no reason. But um, yeah, so like you have a reason to go or so like you're just trying to clear out all the possible Star Ocean games or just being in the putting yourself in the best possible position for Star Ocean six. Yeah, I guess. So, yeah, three weeks ago or so, I I talked about my experience with Star Ocean five and I Star Ocean five. I had been meaning to play it for a while when it kind of first came out. They were, you know, there was some talk about will it get a PC release? So I kind of waited on it and then that never happened. And then six was announced. I'm like, all right, time to finally play five. So I did. And then after that, I was just kind of like, you know what? I have the Star Ocean Blue Sphere game that I've imported and I haven't played it yet. Why not play it now? Um, this is like, you know, a couple weeks ago I started before <laughs> the big dailies of games started to release really. But, um, uh, so what Star Ocean Blue Sphere is, is it's a it's a Game Boy Color game. So it came out in 2001 in Japan. It actually came out a few months after like the Game Boy, the first uh, version of the Game Boy Advance released. So what I'm getting at is, is that it's a late life cycle uh, Game Boy Color game. And it's a Japanese only game. Uh, so it never got a localization. And the one reason is because by the, uh, I, I looked this up, apparently by the time localization was even considered it's like people don't care about game boy color anymore so um that's the reason or a reason so what it is it's a game that came out in between star ocean 2 and star ocean 3 it was made basically to kind of fill a gap while star ocean 3 was in development which that was kind of famously a very long development for the time and um it actually does work as a kind of sequel to star ocean 2 so it does have like plotsy kenny reyna uh, ashton Prices and all those characters they're all back um now the game is only like i said it's only a japanese game and i just decided i have a japanese cart i'm just gonna play it in japanese i don't speak japanese i don't read it i don't care i'm just playing it as is and i'll figure it out i do that sometimes and so i can't really talk about the story you know, okay but be, 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 before before you go into it, what do you think the story is <laughs> uh the star ocean 2 cask crash lands on a planet and mm-hmm. there they are you you spend part of the game like finding your cast members because you only start with a handful of them and the other ones you find on the way mm-hmm. um they're there for one reason or another you pretty much get all of them i think unless i'm unless there's someone i'm forgetting you got Ernest, you got opera you got bowman you got ds you got Prestis, you got uh that witch person I, whose name i forget awesome. you got all of them i did not <laughs> yeah, realize all that, that this game was like a proto sequel or something it is yeah. a sequel, as far as I know. It's, it's like, uh, it's like, it's like, it's I'll like be honest, when I hear Star after. Ocean Blue Sphere, what I think of is that like Blue Sphere mini game from Sonic the Hedgehog. So I always think of this as like a puzzle <laughs> game. Or I think something that's weird. I think that is called Blue Sphere, so that's fair. It's got the same name. Um, but uh anyways. Um so the game is pretty impressive for a Game Boy Color game. Granted, it's you know came out late in the life cycle of a Game Boy game. Um, in terms of like the the uh, the Game Boy era sprites, uh, even the music is pretty decent for a Game Boy game, um, and it's 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 an action RPG. Which you know, imagine an action RPG on the Game Boy, where basically it it kind of feels it kind of looks like 
like like Tales of Fantasia or Tales of Destiny in a sense only uh, more retro feeling and also you're only fighting ever one enemy at a time uh, kind of maybe original Dragon Quest ish um, but it's actually pretty impressive I think for what it is for a Game Boy game and it actually unlike some of the other uh, Star Ocean games like I complained about a few weeks ago you can't just skill spam. You actually have to like time your attacks in some regard and position them in a way. And it's like, this is actually like not half bad for what this is. Uh, for, for, for whatever reason, what I'm thinking of is that if you take a star ocean game based on Adam's comments with it and you strip out the story, cause he doesn't understand it. And you fix the combat. Adam's going to be like, this is my favorite star ocean game <laughs> or something. <laughs> hey, you know I mean, what? Bro- is better than five to be fair. <laughs> I mean, broadly speaking, uh, I am more of a Game Boy or gameplay over story person. Like, if the if the mechanics and the gameplay isn't interesting, I don't really care what it has to say. But um, the uh, the one thing about the game that it that is uh harder to like swallow in a sense is that the dungeons in the game they're kind of like Zelda ish. Like 2D Zelda, like think Oracle games, which also are they came out pretty much the same year, I think, as this, um, or, or or nearby anyway. They're like Zelda-ish dungeons, only way bigger and like a lot trickier in a sense that um, there's these dungeons that have a lot of like various floors, various rooms that interact with each other in in different ways, and. Uh, it's the type of game where I actually looked up maps online to like how to navigate these dungeons because they get really confusing. And if I, if there weren't maps online, I'd be drawing them myself, uh, which I've done before uh, for certain games because they they're pretty labyrinthian. There's also like weird mechanics, like for example, there's like a dungeon with elevators, and like if you're on floor three, let's say, and you take the elevator from floor three up to floor four. And then you somehow make your way back down to floor three with like a different path. Like the room changes. And there's other things like that where it gets like confusing, like how you get from run, one room to another. There's teleport dungeons. Uh, there's a lot of like narrow paths as well, where you can like fall off and fall to the floor below. And sometimes there's sometimes requires backtracking. It's actually like I kind of come I'm of two minds about it. Like I, I think I've lamented on this podcast before that I miss dungeons. So kind of like this is like head first back into that. Like here's a true blue dungeon. But it does kind of get a little bit overwrought and tedious in places. Uh, like I said, I actually did look end up just kind of looking up maps for these dungeons to kind of help me get around because kind of keeping it all in my head. I guess I should also mention, like kind of like if you if you think of like Link to the Past or the Oracle game Zelda, you're kind of going through one room at a time, right? Right. Like you, you go from like the edge of the screen, it shifts yeah. to the next room and whatnot, and it it, it does get a little bit confusing, like trying to remember where was that room again? Like, how do I get back to it? You, you get like only a very, very basic map. Um, so that's like the one part of the game that I think is probably the least like polished, but I still appreciate it to some regard uh, rather than just being, you know, like Star Ocean 5, which is basically just here's a path that you just go down the path and you fight enemies on the path. You know, I miss I miss dungeons. So this, is, this is like, you know, punching me in the face again like here's a dungeon so hey, do you think there will be du- uh, uh, dungeons in divine force will, will that give you what you need <laughs> i hope there's some uh, but I, i've lamented in the past that a lot of especially jrpgs these days are either going for like paths or open fields but and what we've seen what little we've seen in star ocean 6 is it looks like they're really going in on the open field area again they showed like the like the jet boots or jet pack or whatever it was flying around. Yeah, people hate that. I do like the man. What happened? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyways, uh, you know, I, I, the game took me about 30 hours. It's got the same, uh, like star ocean. Uh, one thing I like about star ocean games, and I've talked about this three weeks ago was that the, like the subsystems in place in terms of like, how you level up your character, how you manage your equipment, the crafting systems, and how you like tailor your units a little bit. Like those are some of my favorite components of Star Ocean. And if you kind of dig into those systems, you can do some kind of silly, stupid, crazy, fun stuff in terms of like boosting their attack or 
or modifying like their, you know, their equipment and their statuses and things like that to be like, you know, in Star Ocean 5, for example, I had one of my characters basically, uh, they set up their, their attacks to basically stun every time they hit an enemy. So the enemies would just get stun locked all the time. And like, there's this level of flexibility that I like. Rather than just, you know, you get a level up and you get some more stats at level up. There's more you can do. Yeah, in, Star in, Ocean, Blue, Sphere, in Blue Sphere, you don't have you can do that too. level ups, right? You just have skill points at this one? Yes. So in Blue Sphere, you get skill points. And uh, you basically place your skill points into four different categories. And I actually messed up here a bit. And this is like a game design thing that I, is actually something interesting to me. So one of the, the first character I played as was Dias. Uh, he's the swordsman, like the long-haired swordsman sort of dude from Star Ocean 2, if you don't remember. And I was just kind of, um, I got skill points. You don't get level ups, you get the skill points for ba- for battling enemies. And then I was just sort of evenly distributing his skill points along around his four categories. But it turns out that's actually not optimal because the way the skill system works, and I c- can't uh, claim to understand it completely, is that like when you put skill points into combat skills, it actually detracts from your knowledge skills in a sense. Yeah. And there's also like, cause it's like a cardinal directions, like they're like opposite of each other. And if you put skill points in your technical skills, it actually detracts from your, uh, I forget what it's called. Your, your down skills. I, it was Japanese. I couldn't read it. And, um, so actually like doing that, you kind of create like a sort of well-rounded character, but they don't excel at anything. And actually I kind of, in a sense, I screwed DS up and I actually had to kick him out of my party cause I messed up leveling him up. <laughs> uh. Um, yeah, so it's like that's a game design thing where it's like if you if you put skill points on your character in like an in in an im optimal way, an unoptimal way, you can actually like like it's what's the whatever the opposite of min max is, uh, you're you're kind of like handicapping yourself. So I actually replaced him with Claude, who you get later in the game, and basically I just dumped all his skill points into uh, combat. So basically he, so basically what that means was he was really had really high strength and really high like a health. But he had terrible like um, magic resistance, and also he his personal like skills like crafting and whatnot sucked. But I had other characters to do that, um, so that's kind of an interesting thing about how the, how that game balances its like skill system that you can actually screw it up and kind of make it worse for yourself if you don't do it properly. But regardless, I kind of like that. Like it's just a little bit more interesting to me rather than just you get a level up and you get more stats. Woohoo, you know. So. You want, you want to know um, uh, a crazy feature that the game had that you could actually I know it had some sort of like link system. Yeah, you, 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 if you had a game link cable, you can uh, do local multiplayer in that game, and you can fight against each other. <laughs> yeah, um, go go find a friend with blue spear and a game link cable. So, did you finish the yeah, game? Not... Yeah, I finished it. The uh, final boss. Oh, uh, this uh, the, actually, I got to the final boss, and that's when I realized that DS wasn't going to cut it. And just to kind of, just to kind of put into like put some numbers on this, when I looked at Diaz's stats at the end of the game, he was basically quote max level, but I had screwed him up. His strength was like a hundred and fifty. That was his strength stat. And then I I was struggling against the final boss. I wasn't doing enough damage. And I'm like, and at that point I had done some reading and I kind of realized what I was doing. Again, I'm playing in Japanese, so I'm kind of hurting myself anyway. Uh, I kind of realized, oh, okay, I should have leveled him up differently. And so I swapped him out. I actually took off, like, I basically took two hours extra time to basically train up Claude because I hadn't used him at all. And I put all of his stats into his combat skills. I didn't care about his crafting or intelligence or magic or whatever. And, like, his strength at the end of the game was, like, 450. It's, like, three times higher (laughs) than Diaz. Like, all right, this will work. Um, and I think DS can get that strong if you do them properly, but I didn't. Wait, I, I, I um, need you to back up. Like, how did you screw them up so much at the level system? Okay, so you have four different buckets you can put skills in. Um, on the menu in the game, there's one bucket basically north, south, east, and west. It's like a four cardinal, like Cartesian coordinate direction. Now, combat is on the right, and knowledge is on the left. And if you put points into combat, your knowledge skills become like less available to you. And if you put points into knowledge, your combat skill become less available to you. So really like what you really should do in that game is you should dump all your points into one or the other and kind of like determine like which care, which way you should build a character. But I didn't know that when I was starting out. So when I was doing DS, I was like, okay, let me put some points into combat and some points into knowledge. And then the other two categories as well. But that actually like, 
it like lowers their ceiling in a way. Yeah, um, I, I can't even describe. It. I can't even explain like exactly how it works, but um, the skills sort of um, they cancel each other out. So really, what you should do is just pick one or the other. Now the the trade off is is the way I built Claude. He was he if he got hit by magic, he would just like die instantly because he had like no resistance or whatever the stat is. And also in Star Ocean, and this is true for Star Ocean one and two as well character stats do affect like their crafting capability. So like if you take a piece of Damascus steel and go through the crafting like mini game, what you can get out of it depends on their stats. That's, that's also in Star Ocean one and two. So that's like, that's the, that's the subsystem stuff that I think Star Ocean is kind of fun about, but um, Claude sucked at that. But at that point I was at the final boss. I'm like, I don't need it. Let me just put them all. He's a combat guy. But yeah, so that's one of those things. Like, I, 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 I would probably tweak it that you, to make it so if I was designing this game to make it so you can't like screw up a character so majorly, or at least somehow reset it, like reset the skill point so you can build them a different way. But you couldn't do that. Um, but regardless, my point is, is that it's just that the way you build characters in that game is just a little bit more involved and interesting than just stats, like level ups. Um, and yeah, Star Ocean Five in there. Yeah, so Star Ocean 5 was sort of similar in that Star Ocean 5, I don't think I talked about this last time, so very briefly here, it had roles, and then like you would put roles on a character, you could have up to four, and there are like 100 roles in the game, and they all affect your stats. Like, for example, one of the roles I used a lot was Berserker, and just like you might expect or guess, Berserker raised your attack by 150%, but it lowers your defense by 100%. So what that means is, if you put Berserker role on a character, they're doing a lot more damage, but they're a glass cannon. Um... And then there's, like I said, that why well, I made a character, uh, Emerson, in that game. He was basically just stunning everybody he hit. Because um, I put roles on him that basically added like a 50% chance to stun. And that that's just another form of this sort of like stat component flexibility that you can do in Star Ocean games that you can't do in other series. And that's just one thing I like about it. Yes, it's a little bit more nitty gritty mechanical subsystem stuff. But it's just cool to me that you can do that. Um, but anyways... Uh, one thing about the final boss that I sort of wasn't expecting, and it kind of like it kind of trips up my like my like chronology in my head because this game came out in two thousand one, and I, I acknowledge that, and it came out as a sequel to a PlayStation One game, which is sort of weird, like a PlayStation One sequel on Game Boy Color. Okay, but the final boss actually has like a Valkyrie profile reference, which didn't I did not expect at all for this game. Yeah, the final boss can actually even uh, can even like attack you with Nibelung Velesti. And when I saw that, I was just like, "What?" <laughs> I did not expect it. Um, anyway, <laughs> so Adam, interesting this, game. Is this your favorite Star Ocean game? Uh, no, it's oh. probably I. I like Star Ocean games. Like, there's different points, the different parts of different games. I like more than others. Like. In terms of combat, three is probably still the best. In terms of like story, two is the best. Um, in terms of characters, I don't know. Two is probably still the best. Uh, four, I kind of like its structure, like even though everything about it is everything else about it is bad. Uh, you know, they, they haven't really. I don't think it's it's. We're still waiting for that Star Ocean game that just kind of kind of hits on all puts cylinders, it, yeah, puts rather all than just together. like. Yeah, so we'll see. But it's it, I I'm, I'm I came away pretty impressed by that. Now I need to uh, in order to in order to complete the set, I need to play the original Star Ocean because Star Ocean: Rift Departure is pretty different, um, which is the English the one that was localized on PSP and PS4 and Switch later. So I, I want to play the original Star Ocean, which from what I gather is actually pretty. Uh, it's very different, but also pretty short. Like it's only like a 15 hour game. But you're um, not you're not considering but, the original Star Ocean two. From what I understand, the PlayStation version of Star Ocean 2 and the PlayStation P, the PlayStation Portable version of Star Ocean 2, which is the one I played, are more much more similar to each other than the original Star Ocean and the, and the PSP version of Star Ocean. So there's like okay. more reason for me to check out the original Star Ocean because it's very different versus the original version of Star Ocean 2, which I understand is just slightly different. So, yeah, I remember the only thing that people really got angry about as they do for the psp version was the um the art style change yeah and we've talked about this years ago but i still find it weird that star ocean 2 uh second whatever it is called second story whatever yeah. the psp version is called second um, evolution or something like that second oh. evolution yeah 
it released, it got like a port, just like kind of like, kind of like an up res port on PlayStation 4 in Japan, and it just never left, which is weird. Like it's translated, it's dubbed, it's the same game oh, with an upscale. I'm not sure what happened there. Only gonna but, get released here if the Divide Force sells the puzzle in the list. So they're holding it hostage. <laughs> Well, that covers it for games we've been playing. Obviously, next week is when we start hitting into the big end of February heavy hitters. Uh, some of these we will be introducing on some of our written features that are up on the site right now. And I do want to give shout outs to these. Uh, so two big reviews came up in the last week. One of them is a review for Horizon Forbidden West. Uh, Quinton did this review for us. And this is, again, one of those reviews where it's like, is Horizon those games are they really RPGs? Honestly, not really, but they market them kind of like it, and they have some action RPG light elements to them. We did a, we did the coverage for Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, this game obviously we just released a couple of days ago at the time of recording. We we're hoping to have Quinton on the podcast next week or soon to discuss their thoughts on Horizon Forbidden West. But as, for the moment, in the meantime, none of us on the cast right now have played it. Adam has said that he's interested in playing it once he's done with Voice of Cards. Uh, for the moment, we have the review up on the site if you're interested. It sounds like most of the nitpicks for uh, Quentin on their review of Horizon Forbidden West are kind of open world bloat and kind of how how much there is to do that doesn't feel rewarding. But obviously, I'll let the, the wording in the review speak for itself. And hopefully, we'll get some hands-on discussion of the game in upcoming episodes of the podcast uh, once we have time to play it, because none of us here had early access to uh, this, this one. We also got a review up for Monarch, and Scott did this review for us, and it's up on RPGsite.net. So Monarch is a game that I think we had a fair bit of excitement for last year when it was first kind of announced and teased about who was behind it and what was what their concept was. Um, unfortunately, Scott was very lukewarm on Monarch and was a little bit critical in his review of it, especially some of the themes that it kind of touches into with without a deft hand that it needed. So I know that I think, Josh, you've played like the demo of this game. Do I have that correct? Uh, no, I didn't get around to the demo. I was interested in, in, get, in getting to it, but I just didn't. All right. Also, um, apparently there's like a really transphobic like piece of uh, text in there. So yeah, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I was not sure, but about the context for that one, but that seems you know, not good, not great, not great. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've I've seen that. I've seen that. It's like a journal entry in the game that speaks about a character that it. I don't. I'm, I haven't played the game, so I'm not going to admit yeah. to have full context. But at least the optics are really bad. It looks like it's very clearly transphobic from on you know just from this pe- from this piece alone, and it's kind of baffling how that like got in there, as is to me. Uh, yeah, I, I wonder if that was in the original Japanese script or if that was just a big localization mishap or what's going on with that. Who knows? And- I think the thing about it is that, of course, having a game that touches on unsettling themes, including like depictions of suicide, uh, bullying, incestuous behavior and things like that. Like, obviously, I think those things are fair game, but, you know, you have to be very careful because the camera or whatever, like this, I guess this is like a movie term, but I think people often think that depiction is endorsement and you have to be very careful how your game or story is written to make it clear what is being endorsed and what isn't. And it sounds like based on my reading of Scott's review here, that Monarch just does not really clearly make, make note of where it stands. And it ends up almost seeming like it endorses some really, some shitty stuff and haven't played the game myself. So I have to be careful, but it just, the, the themes are there. And it, like Adam said, the optics aren't great. And on top of that, even just setting that aside, if you don't care about that, uh, he also just found the game very repetitive. You know, just just on a pure gameplay front, he thought uh, he thought the art style was pretty nice and pleasing, but just the gameplay itself wasn't wasn't anything that really. Kept well, his actually, more specifically than that, he actually liked like the combat system itself. It's like this sort of tactical combat, like a little bit strategy RPG type of combat system, and he actually liked that. It was more just the more like macro structure of the game, how you, how you go from like one chapter to the next, to the next, it, it apparently is just kind of very repetitive. So like the combat kind of just doesn't hold it the whole way through. 
So it's like more of a structural thing than a combat thing. And also it sounds like it, it, it's, it's, it's exacerbated if you're going for like the quote true ending, it, it makes it even more repetitive. So it kind of, his review um, kind of felt like they took this sort of idea or slice of the game and then they just sort of stretched it way too, way too long for what it could hold. So. And I don't know if any of us here have plans on playing this, but hopefully we'll get someone on it and be able to talk about it in the coming months. But I don't think, uh, I think most of us have other games kind of interviews either playing or, or planning to play uh, in the near immediate future. We also have an unscored like impressions piece up on the site for the Kingdom Hearts Switch ports. So obviously these just uh, recently released and have had kind of a uh, a mixed reception in terms of why they exist in this form in the first place and the quality of what we ended up getting. Uh, so Cullen, our resident Switch, I don't know, exclusive, uh, what's the word? Impression writer. Specialist. So he, he he was really interested. He's a big fan of the Kingdom Hearts series and wanted to try these. And basically, the his feature is just talking about how he's kind of appreciate that these exist at a very low level, but just also just very disappointed at that this is what we're what we have because th- th- we don't have any other option. And like obviously, Sora is on is in Smash Bros. We've got Melody of Memory on Switch. It makes sense to try to make the whole series available on the console, but it sounds like that it kind of seems like a cheap effort wasn't it's better than nothing but that's kind of the lowest bar you can clear and he's got his impressions on his on his time with the switch uh streaming ports on kingdom hearts up on the site i really wonder how well that's doing for them the just on square enix's end like what were their targets for that and how well has it done i just oh man i still can't believe that 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 happened to it and the last feature up on the site right now is one that is a little bit different it's something that josh put together and it's a listicle for the monster hunter series so obviously later this year we are looking forward to the monster hunter rise sunbreak expansion and josh talked about on his previous uh after playing through monster hunter rise earlier this year he spent time with oh i hope i get the right one with generations ultimate yeah is that the right one and basically you're talking about monsters from that game and others that you would like to see return in the Sunbreak expansion for Rise. Yeah, so Generation was Ultimate was basically like a, a, a greatest hits collection of like almost every monster in the series showing up in it, aside like from the underwater ones. So it's a good spread of like, you know, well, like I replayed through it. I was just like, and I, there's a lot of monsters in it that I was like, man. I hope these come back. I want to see a lot of these monsters on the RE engine and uh, what that would do for them visually. And just a lot of these monsters, like since Monster Hunter in, in general in modern days, since of like it, it's so fast-paced now that monsters are way more aggressive, I'd really want to see how like, they'd animate uh, just in a modern style. And, uh, you know, it's a, it was a fun article to put together, you know, just revisiting this, like, man... There are so many cool monsters in this series. Uh, I have two call-outs. One, I think Bracadios is awesome. It's also like the only monster I really recognize on the list. So I definitely think they should bring Bracadios back. And also, I love that there is a monster called Nibble Snarf. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I hope they bring him back just because I enjoy his name. I think my favorite thing about Nibble Snarf is that it was kind of made to be like a version of like Gobble from... <laughs> from monster Hunter, try that could work <laughs> that's not underwater yeah <laughs> um that the will start as a, as a really funny creature and uh, you know and it would it would finally make people use barrel bombs in mo- in modern games for her i wouldn't be shocked if they don't bring him back specifically because they've been streamlining fights more and more yeah and that's it for the features up on the site so we'll go ahead and go into the news section. Obviously, compared to last week with all the Nintendo Direct Deluge, uh, this week is a little bit lighter. Though there are a few highlights that we want to touch here, as well as a few incidental things that we'll wrap up with uh, towards the end of the podcast. The first thing is that I don't know how much interest we're going to have to t- discussing this, but uh, remember Cyberpunk 2077? What's that? So it's the next-gen update at the end of that roadmap of the 
what is it? Continuous fixes and improvements. Uh, patch 1.5 is now available for PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. A lot of the, the, the they had like one of their what do they call them? Like red stream presentations, basically talking about the uh, the update and what they added and how they you know how they've tweaked the game. And a lot of this was just I think some of us were hoping for a lot more a lot less technical content and maybe some more gameplay tweaks. And there's a huge litany of patch notes, so I haven't delved through them entirely. But a lot of this is just talking about like enhancements and improvements to performance and graphics, which it honestly kind of needed. There are like new weapons, new apartments, and like some other like minor things that they added on the gameplay front, but not really. This really isn't a content pack. It's more of just a of quality of life update. Uh, so... I think we were hoping for, I think when I say we, mostly Alex was hoping to get, have more to chew on here with the cyberpunk update. But if I, I, I sort of, I sort of feel like if you haven't played it and all you were waiting on was for performance considerations, maybe on console anyways, this would be the time to go for it and get to use your next gen console. Otherwise uh, just wait for whatever their other post-release plans are. So I assume Adam who has been waiting is just going to keep waiting for this. I already saw some people report crashes on the next gen updates too. So oh, I am not yeah. surprised. Oh, also <laughs> well, there's a uh, there's also a demo. I guess is that now you can play. Oh, that. okay, great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they, and a lot of these they talk about like they've uh, rebalance of gameplay economy and loot systems. Like mm-hmm. that's just like a bullet point. Like okay, that's 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 carrying a lot of weight. What does that mean? So it. Uh, it, it might be interesting. Obviously, I played this game at launch and just to revisit and see how recognizable it is once they're finally through like fixing it or if it'll just if they're over over deliver, sorry, over promising and under delivering and how how much is actually being changed. I wonder if anyone's tracking that too. like, OK, the, this was the economy before and this is after like a uh, compare and contrast, like how it well, is I, then I, and how it is now. What I was thinking is like people are like how to make credits in the game. And like following these old guides and like they're out of date uh, because yeah. they rebalance the economy in a single player game or something. It's, I don't know. Stuff like that. I always think is kind of interesting, like the vestiges of what the game once was and what it is now. All those 2077 strategy guides that you bought old and busted. Well, and yeah, and we wrote up a few guides on like best cyberware and things like that. And there's like cyberware tweaks and fixes like that. Now we have to either just let that page just kind of like be lost to the, lost to the sands of time or go back and see what they all changed. Another kind of headliner surprise update is that we have noticed a new teaser website from Atlas for the Soul Hackers series. Is it a series or is it a single game? And now it's a series. Uh, it's so this is the game. weird thing. It's a single game, but because it was uh, like the f- the only, besides the Rido game, because it was released here as like Soul Hackers, it kind of took on like a life of its own in a way. Yeah. Okay. In English. Yeah. All right. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remind myself. In English, it's called, it released in English like two, not two decades, maybe like 15 years after the... Uh, it released in Japan. And in, in the West, they called it Devil Summoner Soul Hackers. Is the Devil Summoner part added? Or uh, I, no, it, it is Devil Summoner Soul Hackers. I believe in the West, it's Shin Megami Tensei Devil Summoner Soul oh. Hackers. And the Shin Megami Tensei part is actually like not there in Japan. They're like, please, uh, this game is related to that other game you like. Please buy this. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a weird one. <laughs> out, of, uh, out of nowhere, but I guess it, it, it was like, uh, it was on a slide in Sega a few months back, Adam. If you're like you, yes. you pointed it out, yeah. So Atlas does these surveys every year, and in these surveys, they always mention, or at least for the last few years, like what series would you be interested in a remaster, remake, or new game? And and those in those surveys, they list pretty much everything. They have like Digital Devil Saga, Rido, Devil Survivor. So like you know, it's just kind of listing everything. But what was more interesting and unique that josh just brought up was that in their in sega's midterm plan that they released during uh uh, in in may for their like last fiscal like year results back then um they said one of the slides was like here are the franchises that are dormant that we could potentially return to in some way and it had like knight and shenmue and virtua fighter and a few other things in there which some of those have um but they also mentioned Soul Hackers, which is sort of weird because it wasn't Soul Hackers isn't really a franchise. It's like a game in a subseries in a series. Um, so that, that was kind of weird at the time. But now it makes more sense if, if this is already in production at that point, which it definitely would have been. Um, 
Yeah. So, so the, the the full reveal of this is like on the twenty first, and um, the, uh, they've been having these like these daily like teases of like new screenshots of what seems to be like a new game as more screenshots have been released. And this doesn't look like a remake or remaster, I don't. Um, and one of the most recent screenshots had like an R one prompt at the bottom right corner. So, yeah, people were paranoid <laughs> that it was going to be a mobile game. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, has Atlas, has Atlas like through their official channels ever like advertised? A I don't think game? so. That's the, that's what made me think is like if Atlas themselves is advertising this, I don't think this is a mobile game. But I don't blame people for being scared. Yeah, that it might be. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just broadly, yeah. So uh, if the R one prompt is to be, to be uh, is true and they're not fucking with us, then this will at least come to a PlayStation system. Uh, it's PlayStation Five uh, exclusive. You never know. But, and then, uh, so Soul Hackers I, I, itself, I, Josh, Josh has played it, and I've played it. I'm not sure if anyone else has here. Um, Soul Hackers is like, it's like it's an SMT ish title, but it has more focus on like the story and the characters, and less on like law neutral chaos. And it's got this cyberpunk vibe, and it's really cool. Uh, I played the 3DS version, so I didn't play like the Japanese like Saturn or PlayStation versions, but. Um, it's one of those. It's like it's I, I. So Atlas has been releasing these um these opening videos for like the older Persona games, and I, I remember making a comment in our staff chat that like I wish Atlas would like you know release a game with this sort of tone again. Um, it's kind of more like I don't know cyberpunk, edgy, like a little bit somber in a way, kind of moody. Um, cause you know, it's a pretty different from like the more upbeat persona ish styles and whatnot, um, of the modern games. And then here comes soul hackers. I'm like, that kind of has the sort of mood I was looking for here. Uh, so I'm hoping that it can, that it can provide that. Yeah. Vis- um, visually, not, not, not totally, but visually, like just, you know, from the few screenshots that they've released, like it reminds me of the visual style of Tokyo Mirage sessions. Um, Honestly, obviously, we have yet to see like a video to see the tone of it, but I I hope it really retains like the atmosphere of Soul Hackers because it's such it is such a it was such a unique thing back then, and I think it it it's kind of it holds to it really well. It's it's so that's the best part of Soul Hackers to be in my opinion. Yeah. I actually think like gameplay wise, it's a little bit weaker than most SMTs, but that that like vibe is great. It, it is it is such a it is such a, a cyberpunk. Uh, aesthetic through like a nerdy lens, like a, a, a 90s rendition of like nerds uh, in that game. Like, uh, if you've ever seen like uh, movies like Hackers, you know, like they, they have such like a what what, what would these, we would see as like a juvenile understanding of like uh, nerd culture, you know, like uh, nor like quote unquote normies, like what they think nerds are. It's like kind of reflected in that game, but more earnestly. And by the way, I don't know if you mentioned it, but also on the website is a countdown timer, which is going to uh, Monday Japan time, I believe. So we'll, we'll know it before next week, regardless. And yeah, I don't it's know. very soon. Yeah, so uh, n- nothing officially announced for like the West, but at least I don't think they've pointed to that on any of their I, Western social channels. I wonder if the well, I wonder if the Atlas West actually the, is following this because because all of the all of the things like that has been surrounding the market this game have also been like subtitled I think or have, there's at least English text to it. Oh the, yes, um a- official Atlas West has been keeping up with the Soul Hackers countdown. So uh, okay, at the so very least yeah okay. this is Good this is probably well one there's probably localization confirmed to Hopefully, simultaneous worldwide like SMT five. Uh, speaking of countdowns, uh, you must have added this because I don't remember this. Yeah, but I guess Capcom, with absolutely no like context at all, also started a countdown website that is also yep. ending on February twenty first. Any ideas on this? I, I on my. As far as I can no, tell, it has I no really, context. Like uh, what series? Yeah, yeah. What, I really, really. I really, 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 really wanted to be Dragon's Dogma. I don't know if that's gonna happen. Um, I that's the only reason I put it here is like I hope it's Dragon's Dogma, but if it's not, but it's I think it's also coinciding with some Street Fighter event also. But I don't know. Who knows? It could be anything. <laughs> I hope it's Dragon's Dogma. It, but my most educated guess is maybe it's probably Street Fighter related. Street Fighter Six. Yeah, maybe you know the 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 last DLC character for Street Fighter Five, Luke, 
Uh, they they've uh, labeled him as like someone who's like gonna be important to the future Street Fighter. So, whatever the fuck that meant. So who who knows? But if it's a if it's a cool new RPG Capcom then like Dragon's Dogma, hit a hit us up. Let us know. It's gonna be uh, ending very soon as well. It's gonna be like at the time of this recording, like tomorrow night, ten p.m. Pacific on February twenty. Did you know we're less than a month away from Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin? Hell yeah. Thank God. So, dude. so this is this is obviously at the very tail end of its marketing cycle. So we've we've discussed like as the as the party has come into as each of those characters has been introduced about the four fiends and how they've been introduced and uh, other stuff about the battle systems. And now basically it's another basically another info drop for people that really like to dig deep into all of these about about expert jobs, about Merolith. And about a location called the Wicked Arbor. So I don't know if uh, Kite or Adam really dug through these. To, if there's anything really at this point, it's like too granular for me to be like, I'm already interested in the game. I don't need to know like all this stuff ahead of time. But we've got all that information about like the expert jobs, about how you can combine, you can switch instantly between two different jobs, and how you can um, uh, unlock expert jobs once you max out a basic job. I don't know. Do they call them basic jobs? The expert uh, okay. jobs that they've talked about are Dark Knight, Void Knight, Ninja. And I forget exactly the unlock conditions for each, but they talk just basically about the flavor of those three jobs and uh, how they play. I'm excited for this game so much. I cannot wait. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then the other big news from the week for a good portion of our audience is the big Final Fantasy XIV live letter that was outlining, uh, at least purported to outline the next decade of the game going forward and the road to what follows after Endwalker. So I have to defer over here to James as the one who is the uh, Chow never did show up. So we'll have to just lean on James for this one. So I guess I'll just state it bluntly. James, how is the next 10 years looking for Final Fantasy 14, according to the live letter? Well, so they said that it was the next 10 years, but really what they talked about was kind of stuff leading up through this expansion to the next. Uh, the two major things they focused on were quality of life changes that they're kind of doing with um, dungeon content that they're going to be patching through uh, and Walker. So they're going to make it so that you can uh, do the Realm Reborn, Heaven's Ward, and Stormblood dungeons with trusts. Um, and they're also changing up things for the end of a realm reborn um, duties that were like eight person to now be four person um, duties themselves. I think. Well, no, no. Uh, most of them are now. It's going to be uh, now. It's being retrofitted that they're actually going to be uh, solo duties now. And then the last like encounter is going to be a four person trial or something like that. It, it sounds like what they're doing is basically trying to make the early parts of the game since it's played linearly through the expansions more convenient to like be a latecomer if, if everyone's all like shifted towards Shadowbringers and well, or whatever follows content having the early content from Heaven's Sword and Stormblood not so much of that not okay. so much of that because they said that their main reason for doing this is that despite 14 obviously being very very successful the dev team themselves have noted that there's still many people that do not want to play the game because Maybe they've played every final fan like numbered Final Fantasy except for eleven and fourteen, and they want to try and do something to make it more palpable for folks that even though it's an MMO, they don't want to play with other players. There's still gonna be things where you have to do it with other players, and the patches are only gonna be for the main scenario dungeons. So any optional dungeons you'll have to do with other players. But yeah. I guess that makes sense. Uh, I'm kind of the mindset where it's like, it's an MMO. You might have to gasp or talk to someone else when playing through it. But I do know, it's obviously, that a lot of people are yeah, really. It's kind of weird because we talk about how Lost Ark, how you like, I don't care about the story. I'm being a little bit uh, dramatic, but like, I don't care about the story. I just don't care about the gameplay. Where so I know a lot of people who found Fantasy 14 really into just the story and they don't touch uh, extreme or savage content at all. Um, so they're just, they did. This is, seems like it's the update for that sort of player. Yeah. Um, the other major thing that they uh, announced, well, they did have a general roadmap of what to expect with the Endwalker patches. Um, basically, we're getting a new sort of uh, type of content called Criterion Dungeons, 
which has scaling difficulty based off how many people enter them, uh, up to like between one and four people. Uh, that's not the same as deep dungeons, which were already a thing, which we're also getting with Endwalker patches, uh, currently slated for 6.3. Um, and it seems like these Criterion dungeons might be the new main side activity for Endwalker because they're getting introduced the same time that the relic weapons appear to be. Which uh, relic weapons are like the general like end game grind for folks that have already exhausted everything else and they want to like go to, like grind up something that's not just dialable and whatnot. Um, oh. relic yeah, weapons are purely that... cosmetic, though, right? Uh, no, no, oh, no. They do no. have they have more uh, materia slots. Even if the eye level is lower, they tend to have better base stats, stuff like that. Um. But yeah, there's that. Uh, we are obviously getting a new ultimate fight in patch 6.11. We are getting a second ultimate in patch 6.3x. I'm like whichever patch after 6.3, which implies that there's a possibility we'll get three ultimates this patch cycle. Well, this uh, expansion cycle, which would be cool because uh, there was only one ultimate fight last uh, expansion because of COVID. So there is a chance. It's not confirmed yet. They didn't fully detail what's going to be in patch 6.5, so we don't know what's going to be in patch 6.5. If there will be a third ultimate, I personally think they're probably just leaving it vague because they probably want to do it, but obviously shit can happen if COVID keeps like being a problem. That might push things back, and they'll, they don't want to overcommit, basically. Um. The other major thing is that they showcased graphical updates and they said at least with uh, 7.0, so the next expansion, it'll be the first phase and really upgrading the game's graphics, uh, which will, for the first phase at least, it'll be relatively simple stuff. They're adding more um, um, cast lights in, in scenes. Basically, they're making it so that scenes can have more light sources, which will change the dynamics of how areas look. Uh, shadows have been will be improved. Texture quality will be improved. Material quality will be improved. And um, one thing that they did show off was um, various upgrades for the ways that uh, characters' faces and hair will look. And th there were some memes probably you've seen about the uh, male world dine where it's like, looks smooth and now you can actually see some of its po his pores and it's like <laughs> oh that's a that's an upgrade i do like how they specifically like call out that it's not meant to be photorealistic and it's not meant to be like equivalent to like a single player traditional game so they're trying to like it sounds like they're trying to like say like this is still like a game that has to render dozens of characters on screen at once uh in lince Lamenta or whatever um yeah. and they did also mention that regardless of how whatever they push for the texture work and the lighting work, but they do have planned support for the PlayStation 4 version of the game through the next expansion, at least. Yeah, my guess is that um, if the silicon shortage wasn't a thing, they might have decided to cut off uh, PlayStation 4 for 7.0. Because by the time it'll be out, it'll be like three and a half years since the uh, mm -hmm. PlayStation 4 has been out, something like that. So I, I don't know. But um, yeah, yeah. Lots of interesting information. Uh, I do find it kind of a bad look that they didn't say anything about the Xbox version that they've been like talking about for years now. They just need to start in the next 10 years. Yeah, I don't know. Just really... Uh, I don't know. Actually, I didn't realize the Xbox version was a known thing. I always thought it was just kind of like a it would be nice or a rumor or something. Uh, there was definitely, um, there's definitely been some situations where earlier it was like, Oh, we'll look into it. And then they said, Oh, well, it's, we have to wait on the Xbox side. And then people started asking Phil Spencer and he said, Oh yeah, we've done everything that has been asked of us. It's on square and X. So like he kind of pushed the ball in their court. And I feel like ever since then the wording has changed a bit and it's like, I, probably a bit of an awkward situation, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, shit or get off the pot. <laughs> like, 
come on. I'm not even going to play it on Xbox, but it feels like the fact that they keep beating around the bush and like some of the most recent like explanations sound like, oh, yeah, it is definitely coming. Just like, come on. Come on. Don't do this. I wonder how many people on Xbox would uh, like uh, what's like uh, how many existing Xbox players right now are like I'm still waiting for Final Fantasy 14 I wonder like what the statistics are there Uh, I don't know I don't know that's a weird one and the last kind of semi-major piece of news for this week at least an interesting talking point is that in the fallout of the big Microsoft acquisition of Activision Blizzard in the last month uh, obviously, this is, as it always does, ramped up speculation about who's next. And then, of course, uh, I don't think we talked about it, but Sony acquiring Bungie uh, was also yeah. around the same time. And uh, I don't remember the, I don't know the context of this, but VGC was having a discussion with Platinum Games and discussed with the CEO at Sushi Anaba about the, just the, whether they would consider acquisition offers. Uh, I don't know how the phrasing of the question initially was, whether they'd be open to it specifically or what they just thought about the concept in general. And Anaba basically was not too coy about it, basically saying, sorry if you hear my dog sneezing in the background, uh, basically saying that he doesn't understand why Japanese companies are more passive and less, you know, less eager to be acquired. Basically, he's kind of keeping the door open about Platinum Games specifically possibly being open to acquisition talks as long as the freedom is respected, as long as they're still able to make the games that they want to make. Uh, the most important thing is for them to have the freedom to make the games they want to make. When I hear about recent acquisitions, I don't think Microsoft is going to start micromanaging Activision. Uh, and that w- basically, if he if his gut feeling is correct, he would be OK with that idea for Platinum Games as well. So. Obviously, Platinum Games has kind of been trying to like find their footing as a company. They've gotten into publishing. Uh, they've kind of had to take on some licensed game in recent years. We're still waiting on Bayonetta three as kind of like their big showcase title for the recent times. So it's just kind of interesting to think about whether they're like on the table for being potentially one of the ones that is picked up by uh, one of the console holders or hell. Uh, we we talked about last week about some of like the European cons- consolidation of. Uh, different indie developers with Midgard Studio, and I think another one uh, this week. There, so, there is two more in the last week. Uh, yeah, it just keeps happening. Well, while we're talking about acquisitions, there's a few other like tidbits here and there. One is Nacon, which is a French publisher. They also do like peripherals and controllers and stuff. They acquired <laughs> yeah, Laker the Studio. Company, as you said last week. Oh, I did call them the Hobo Company. Yeah, <laughs> they acquired Laker Studio, who's doing like Metal Slug Tactics. And then they also acquired Datalik, who is doing like the Gollum game, and they're German, I believe. Um, the Lord of the Rings Gollum adventure, whatever it is, game. So, so there's a a little bit of M and A like wars going on in France right now with Nacon and Focus Home. And then um, Ubisoft had their uh, financial report recently, and in it, Yves Guimau was asked like about acquisition and i don't have it in front of me here since it's off the cuff but he basically sounded like he was kind of like platinum where he's like open like if it's you know if our autonomy is is respected and we're allowed to do what we want to do and you know something like that it, he didn't he didn't just shut the door on it anyway so yeah and it's important to note that like this is not like something new or anything like companies are always talking to other companies behind the scenes about acquisitions I think the the investors are asking about it now because of the more high profile ones that have come out recently. So, but just not to like people who don't know, like the companies are always talking about companies like, Hey, would you be open to it? And then negotiations, Mm -hmm. you know, that's uh, always an ongoing thing. Um, It's uh, I I think the, the big thing that Inaba points out in that uh, interview with VTZ as well, is like, it, it is interesting to see like, um, why uh, Japan is so averse in general to a- 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 acquisitions? Like they're very like not open or very like isolated. Like they don't really entertain the thought as much as like you know the the Western culture and, and that sense about mergers and acquisitions. Like st- hell, the the one that still sticks out out of my mind is the big one is like Square Enix when they merged. You know, <laughs> like I, I can't and then I, I can't really think of like any like 
major major ones as big as that like the, there is like you know the sort of uh atlas jumping around when they were under index and then when index was finally out of the picture sega uh took uh, up atlas but there, there's not a lot of like big big japanese game acquisitions that really stick out in my head um no i can't I, I we've we've had we've been with square unix for so long that sometimes like for me i don't know if i just wasn't playing rpgs at the time but like I, I don't think oh yeah they were squaresoft at one point maybe i just i'm old enough that i should like have fond memories of squaresoft games but i was i wasn't really playing them at the time yeah it's, it's, uh, it's, when it's, i was playing star ocean blue sphere the title uh, screen it says enix hell yeah oh yeah by itself <laughs> yeah it's it's really funny that like you have to like remind people it's like that's just when the, the square geeks are different because right they were separate cup like yeah there was a there was a time a good old time when they were separate but uh, uh, the the other thing that came out of this uh, interview with uh, Platinum um, was uh, when they were asking Kamiya, you know, uh, <laughs> one of the interview questions like uh, somehow got to the topic of NFTs, and then they asked, "Were you surprised to see Konami get involved in NFTs so quickly?" And Kamiya's answer was, "Not really. If it smells like money, Konami's going to be there in a heartbeat." <laughs> um, and then uh, he follows up and says, uh, he said he has, uh, uh, honestly, I have uh, zero interest in the subject. Um, Inaba is basically, you know, the, not, not really up for it. But the, the main takeaway is, uh, he says, I think what Inaba-san just, just said really resonated with me because I consider myself a user at heart more than a businessman. If it doesn't, if it doesn't have a benefit, any benefit for users at the moment, uh, then, you know, they want to consider it. in the future, if it's expanded upon in a way that's a positive side for users, then maybe it'll be... I'll start to be interested to see what they have to say uh, do with it. But right now, like Inaba, Kabiya, Platinum Games in general, their kind of stance on NFTs is like uh, they don't really see the how it benefits users uh, at the moment. And you know, I get that's I mean, that, that's a pretty respectable it, answer. It, it's them. it's very funny though that they said um, the way they phrased it, basically saying, "Oh yeah, Konami's obviously doing that because they're greedy." When Square Next, which is pub- who's publishing Babylon's Fall, is like. Or we want to we want to go in on NFTs. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, that very different perspectives are <laughs> throughout all, a lot of cre- creators and businessmen out there. Um, but it's just so it's just so funny. Like when Kamiya Kamiya ever talks about Konami, it's like yeah, you know, it's no surprise. <laughs> Remember, like, uh, and recall just a few months ago to celebrate Castlevania, uh, Castlevania anniversary, Konami announced Castlevania NFTs to celebrate the Castlevania anniversary. Like, thanks, Konami. Never letting anyone down. I mean, when, when Anaba says, like, I'm not, I, I think of this like a, like a consumer, like a gamer, like a player, and I don't see what it benefits me. I'm kind of like mood, like, exactly. Yeah. A couple other small pieces of news as we sort of wrap up into the final bit of this podcast here. Uh, The first bit is a localization announcement for a game that was announced about a year ago, and that is the dungeon crawling RPG from Experience called Mon Yu. And I remember about a year ago. What's the full title? Yeah, it has like one of those like light novel sort of titles, which uh, I'm not going to attempt the Japanese. The rough English translation, according to Gamatsu, is something along the lines of defeat monsters to get strong swords and armor. We believe in the day the heroes will defeat the demon lord. So it has like one of those light novel sort of things. Uh, yeah. I don't know what you call that style title, but it, it is coming out for Nintendo Switch and PC next year in the West. Uh, this announcement was made just by a press release. We didn't get any new footage or information other than the intent to localize it, but we will see it next year. And this is from the same people who did a uh, Stranger of Sword City and Demon Gaze. So I assume that either Adam and or James will be interested in this one. It just seems right yeah. up their alley. I'm not so hot on the art style on this one. It's the uh, Mota who did uh, Seventh Dragon. Now, on Seventh Dragon, I think it sort of worked. Seventh Dragon is a DS game where everything was like super chibi, but it's, you know, it kind of fit that retro DS game style. But for like an HD ish game, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> it's like this. Pretty- it's like this weird, like kind of moblob chibi art, and also with like characters who are adults wearing, like you know, not a lot of clothes, but they look like children. So it kind of ventures into kind of creepy territory. <laughs> I'm just like, eh. they're technically adults and they're drawn like dolls. I don't know. Yeah. 
So. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not too dissimilar from like Etrian Odyssey, but yeah, I can see what you mean, like the specifics. Just squish down people. But yeah, they kind of like... announced this pretty uh, pretty far in advance. So it's not to expect it until next year. Uh, PC release is actually kind of interesting, though, but early 2023. So I don't think we'll see much more of this for the n- next few months. How it's many, cool to know uh, that's coming. Uh, so like this was like the only non-Atome announcement in that Axis stream, as far as I know. Oh no, there were there were like no, a, like, they had they had like the they had like this like side scroller like animals and biplane yeah, shooter game. Yeah. But I, like, like how many Atome games were there compared to non-Atome games on that stream? There there were five Atome games, and then there's Counted. like, and then three non, I think. And nothing against it. That's like yeah. they found their but audience. Yeah, yeah. Axis found their audience. It's just, it's just a very. We go into those shoots like, how many Atomes are they gonna announce? And it, it, the coolest thing about those shoots, it's like it, 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 like the real, the big excitement because we don't know. Like I'll be the first. Thing, I don't know anything about Atome games. Like I, like I have some friends who work in that field and they do amazing stuff and all. More power to them. Uh, but like when I go to those streams and I, and I just like I'm there to like witness the chat because a lot of people like you did like the first like five seconds of a new Otome announcement, people are going wild. It's like, oh my god, it's that game. I'm like, that's fucking awesome. <laughs> and like, yeah, these I, people are going right away. <laughs> it's fun to be like vicariously excited for other people. Like, I don't know what this is, but I'm happy you're happy. Like, genuinely. Uh, we also have another announcement of, is this, uh, oh, this is a mystery horror RPG. It's in a remaster, actually. This is Pocket Mirror Golden Trom which is a remaster of a mystery horror RPG that originally released in 2016. So this is announced for PC at some point this year, and we got a teaser trailer for it from the Giga Games. How do you pronounce that? The Giga? The Giga? The I don't know, actually. The Giga Games. So uh, this looks kind of like the like Yumi and Nikki style horror RPG with like the... Uh, well, it's, it's RPG Maker. So yeah. Josh, what was your comment about the title they went with here? No, there's another one. It was another Degika. Oh, it, was like oh another, it wasn't it was this another, one. Yeah, it was another publisher. I, I, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but they're basically remake. Uh, re- oh, okay, there, there it is. There, there's a remake for a romance visual novel that came out on like the PC ninety eight. It was called like Dokusei, and like, um, it's like the the I think the original title is like Dokusei remake or whatever. But in the West, like under the Shiravun and uh, the publisher, like they, the the uh, subtitle they went with for the West is like Bangin' Summer. So it's like, don't you say Bangin' Summer? <laughs> like, <laughs> it was a funny, uh, sure. it was really funny. That but, is you know, a word choice. That is definitely a word choice. But you know, they, they know their audience and it's definitely, you know, uh, definitely hot and heavy game for the for those people. But then, yeah, the... The Pocket Mirror Golden Tr- Trom uh, is is not that game. It's a whole other different uh, thing. I, this is, but you know, cool, cool. And to, fa- to finish out here, just a couple of uh, release dates and delays. Um, Pathfinder: Wrath of the Righteous, its first DLC, Inevitable Excess, is being delayed by a little under a month. It was supposed to launch like last week, but it was delayed to March third. Uh, tactical RPG Dark Deity, this was released on PC last year, uh, will release on Nintendo Switch on March 17th. This game is, it's this is, uh, this is like a Fire Emblem indie, indie game in like the vein of like GBA or a Fire Emblem. And apparently it's decent, but I know it's got some like major bugs on the PC version. And that's actually why we never reviewed it because Jess was playing it and ran into a game breaking bug. And I got I when we when I posted the switch announcement, we got I got some replies. Apparently the PC version is still bugged. Oh so it's God. like, well, that's not a good look. So like why are they why are they porting it if they can't fix the PC it, version? Exactly. Uh, apparently it, it's coming with an update with like to the maps and stuff like like visually. So maybe it's, it'll have bug fixes too, like released kind of simultaneously with the switch and like a Steam version update. Um, but I don't know. Uh, Spell Force Three, reforced, has been delayed to June seventh. It was originally supposed to launch. I don't know anything about uh, this game? <laughs> yeah, it was. It, it was originally supposed to launch uh, in December. I think. Like, I'm trying to decide. Like, is reforced the real word? 
It's not. I'm pretty sure it's not. But that's what it's called. Uh, yeah, because I, I know force three re- reinforced. I know reinforced, but I was like reforged. What? Reforged? No. So it was originally supposed to launch in December, then delayed to March, and now delayed to June seventh. Baldur's Gate three got another new update. And the thing is, is that we haven't really been covering Baldur's Gate 3 updates just because they're a little bit granular and it's kind of like par for the course for early access that they're just tweaking and changing things. Uh, and this update, yeah, we, updates... we typically just philosophy. We don't I don't cover like all like the early access updates because early access games get updates all the time. And it, it kind of at that point, like once it's out in early access, unless there's like a major like addition or tweak, it's just kind of like they're just in development. They're like add a new level or add a new class or whatever. Or so it's tweak just like, this. you know. Right. So. So, yeah. So the, the, the little granular points here is that it added the barbarian classes, overhauling the UI. But the main thing we brought it on the podcast here is that uh, they have Larian's gone on record saying that they don't expect it out of early access until 2023. So uh, I think we I forget the exact contents, but we were talking about anticipated games for this year and Baldur's Gate 3 was absent. Uh and it sounds like maybe serendipity. It's not coming out this year. It doesn't seem like it is. So it looks like Baldur's Gate 3's 1.0 release will be something to look forward to for 2023. I need to catch up on Baldur's Gate. I played the first one. That's it. I need to go play the Game Boy Color spinoff. <laughs> the Japanese only uh, one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I played Baldur's Gate 3 like in its initial early access, like version 0.1, whatever you call it. I'm not that interested in the game to be like, all right, now I want to see what its later early access version is like. Yeah, this and just wait, also play it on right? release. It's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I've done that very recently of like, am I going to keep up with this in early access with Vampire Survivors? And I'm like, I, I'll just wait for the full release at this point because I've, I've exhausted like a lot of the content in that game already. So it's just like, I should just probably wait for its like quote unquote full release just to like have more content. Yeah, you, yeah, you got your taste. And now it's just like, yeah. rather than, you know, playing it at every update just you know like wait for the product as yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. i can't i can't i can't do that i can't like i have such a limited like not patience for early access games but i, I can't I can't be like the type that like keeps up with them with every update it's like oh man they released the released the update that added like uh, a chair and a fairy cool <laughs> And finally, we did get the announcement of RPG Maker Unite, which is the first version of RPG Maker built for the Unity engine. So to be released worldwide in 2022 at some point. I saw uh, a lot of people excited about this. I'm assuming people that are more familiar with development than I am. Apparently, it's a, it's a really interesting idea to have if you're like if you're if you know Unity and you want to make RPGs, and you know RPG Maker, to have these kind of come together like this is, I guess, appealing to, you know, those types of people wanting to make these sorts of games. But yeah. I don't know enough about it. Uh, yeah, I saw a lot of, lot of... Uh, I'm sure Kemco will be thrilled. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I saw a lot, a lot of excited anticipation uh, on our comments and uh, on Twitter, and, like, that's really cool, like, because, you know, like... You know, you, you know an RPG maker game when you see one, and uh, I think for a good amount of creators, like they've really, uh, like they've seen the extent of it, and now this just opens like a really, really like opens a lot of brand new doors to it. As like even not just like people who are look are RPG maker creators looking over to trans- transition to a new engine, but like like uh, like you mentioned earlier, just like existing Unity developers. Who want to t- tinker around with this engine as well? So this is I'm kind of excited to see like what we see out of this, to be honest. And that covers us for news for this week. So uh, we've still got a good, good sized podcast out of it. A lot of follow up from stuff that's uh, releasing this month and into next, and some new dates as things kind of get pushed back out of the uh, Q1 window. Uh, obviously, we do have those four features on the site that I mentioned. I have we have the reviews for Horizon Forbidden West and Monarch as well as the impressions on Kingdom Hearts on Switch, as well as the Monster Hunter listicle. Uh, All the news that we've covered is up on the site. Hopefully for next week on the podcast, we will get uh, some hands-on, maybe not necessarily next week, but the next coming weeks uh, for Horizon Forbidden West, maybe Monarch, and then also the late February releases of Atelier Sophie 2, Elden Ring, and into March with Stranger of Paradise. And I'm sure I missed a couple in there because it's a crowded time of the year. So lots of... Yeah, lots of... 
lots of hands-on game discussion for the next uh, couple episodes of the podcast, I anticipate. I'm not 100% sure what order they will appear in, uh, but stay tuned. Yeah, this is the last pre-Elden Ring era podcast. So. Oh, I yeah. suppose that is true. Here we go. All right, so we will see you all next time. Thank you so much for listening. Until then, stay safe, take care. Talk to you next time.